Hello again, friends! And you are our friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive through right here on a fall day in the fall of 2023. <laughs> Without a gardener in sight, I think we're in the clear for a fun, <laughs> rip-roaring edition of this <laughs> fine podcast. I'm your host, the great Brian Last, and here he is, Mr. Happiness himself, Jim Cornett. Oh, boy, you try to put on a, a real happy front, you two-faced individual. Try to put, oh, put all that positive energy out of there, put that happiness into the air on the airwaves for the, the listeners out there in podcast land. But that's a complete 180, a complete no. difference from what you just were. I told you I was happy today. No, you grumpy sub. Here's the thing. You are not a friend ever. You may be a friend of the listeners, but you're not a friend to everything out there because you just told on yourself. Because here I was thinking I was supposed to be the grumpy one because our ridiculous weather. Remember last week I said it was freezing. It was down in the 20s. Freezing fucking cold, frost, ice everywhere. Then yesterday was 83 degrees. It was two degrees off the warmest day in the history of November here in this particular metropolitan area. And now it's back to 60s, and it's going to get cold again. And we just don't, I'm, I'm just all flimmy and verklempt. And my hips hurting me because, you know, my rheumatiz is acting up. And I thought I was going to be the grumpy one. But right before we start recording, you are complaining about how stuffy it is there in your palatial estate. And you said you would open the window to get some air if it wasn't for the birds. And I said, well, you don't like the birds? And you said, well, they'd be chirping and singing, and it would ruin the, the program, the recording. How can the, the faint sound of musical birds in the background hurt a recording that has voices that sound like yours and mine on it to begin with, Brian Last. First of all, your initial statement was already a lie. So let's just start with that being said publicly. You started with a lie, so everything else you said should watch not your, be considered Watch your mouth, counselor. The truth. What I said to you was I would open the window because my fan is making some noise. And, and it's I a nice- I said he's there in person? It's a nice, I have more than one fan. I have another one on the other side of the room. It's a nice brisk day. I would open the window, but the birds and the leaves, I said, and the leaves. Over the fluttering of the fall leaves. All the leaves are brown and the sky is gray and Brian Lash shut his window and don't want to hear about the day. The lead, the fluttering of the fall leaves and the, the twinkling and the chirping of the birds in the trees singing so melodically oh fantastically logically what i'm not going to get into super tramp today but you want the window that, open that would bother you it would be like, it, it, our podcast would turn into a calming All right. and soothing Let's calm you down broadcast it now what did he say he left the mic have you I, left the broadcast position i still have the headphones yeah i'm gonna pick the headphones off hold on no, oh, now, guy. Well, ladies Open and gentlemen, I'm, I'm apologizing the for this. The window and I stay open until I get cold, and you can do your whole zipsy doo dah thing. <laughs> All right. You, you take my zippity doo dah out of my zippity doo ass, apparently. I'm just trying to turn this podcast into a, a calming, soothing, kind of like a mini Ripperton loving you kind of vibe here today. And you're getting all offensive and defensive, and you've you've, you've just you've, you've just lost yourself, Brian. You can't be unprofessional and leave your position during a broadcast. I can't believe you mentioned loving you without trying to hit the high note. I I I will hurt myself, as Mama Cornette would say. If I tried to do that, I'd strain my milk. Did your mother ever tell you that? I've we never heard any of these things what? from my mother. No. What, are you, what kind of mother in the world would never say to her child when your, the said child was going to pick up something heavy or try to do something that would, that would strain him and said, don't do that. You'll strain your milk. Don't do that. You'll hurt yourself. Sounds more likely than. Well, that's a broad term. I'll because strain the, my know, milk. 
I may be I may be willing to risk potential some type of vague non-specific injury, but if I knew I was going to strain my milk and my fucking balls was going to be up in my watch pocket and my crotch was going to be down at the cracker, then then I would watch out specifically. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been the weather here on the drive thru No, talking about the weather, I'm telling you what, but the dew points are on target. And 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 by the way, it's going to be fair weather in the state of Kentucky from here on out. Just real briefly, we reelected Governor Andy. Andy Bashir got reelected. He's done a phenomenal job the past four years. He was running against this Republican Trump licking piece of shit. And so, of course, since the difference was literally polar opposites, uh, Andy won by six percent. But it is Kentucky, and he's the. I, I, I take pride in that. He's the only Democrat that won the election because the only Republican that Trump personally endorsed was his opponent. So maybe that's a good sign for the future of our democracy. But Brad, for a second here, I want to ask you your opinion on something that is the, the biggest scourge that we face as a people, as a country, as a, as a society, a humanity, whatever the case, the worst goddamn plague on society today how do you feel about these you scan self checkout pieces of shit? Uh, I don't typically have too big a problem. I mean, my biggest issue is just like the scale. If you actually scan the thing, then it tells you that thing's not on the scale and it's on the yes. scale. Yes, yes. Other than that, it would be wonderful. Oh, for fuck's sake! So you're willing to do other people's work for them and give them your money? I'm willing to try to get out of any store I'm in as fast as I can because I got no. things to do. No, that's the problem. I have things to do. Well, that's the problem. No, the problem is not that you have things to do. The problem is that you can't get out of the store fast. Yes, if you're going in to buy a bag of Cheetos and a box of rubbers, that may be one thing. But when you go to do literally a plethora of grocery shopping and you've got a goddamn one of those cards stacked up it looks like the homeless people on Broadway, and there's four or five different customers trying to do that, obviously trying to spend a couple hundred bucks minimum a piece with size these carts. And there's five of them lined up because you've got one puny individual moving at the rate of a glacier, checking people out while all these you scan, they've got people standing there watching the people scanning their own U's. Why couldn't those people just be checking us fucking out? It's their goddamn profession. They know how to do it. They know where the barcode is. They know how to fucking weigh the goddamn turnips. They know what department the goddamn fucking rubbers come from. So why am I going to go in and give them hundreds of dollars and do their job, Brian, is what I'm asking you. And you talked about it. If it's fine again, if you're going for goddamn ice cream and ketchup, then you can put it on that little turn, uh, the round turny thing with those little tiny plastic bags. And you got room. But if you're doing an entire giant cart, a, a plethora of items, large and small, bulky, heavy, whatever, you got no fucking room. And if you don't put the goddamn barbell plate onto the fucking scale, then it says put the item in the bag. Well, I can't because the item is bigger than the goddamn stand I've got to work with. Or then it says, well, pick out the variety of parsnips from the produce department and enter here. I don't know what these fucking things are. I just fucking want to buy them. I don't know the differences in the species and the organicness of goddamn green and red and yellow and bell peppers. Just charge me for them and be done with it. And every other item. Attendant, call for help. What? He's got to come over, push a button. Or it's telling me to put the item back in the bag when the item's in the bag to begin with. And it took me literally 20 minutes to go through this shit. It is not my profession to learn how to fucking check out and bag groceries. I am paying them for that service. I, Brian, 
fulfill the customer part of the contract. I go in there, I choose their merchandise that I wish to purchase, I am more than pleasant to all of their employees until pushed too far, got a great relationship with the meat gentleman and the fishmonger, and there's another fellow out there in the meat department that listens to the program quite often. And then I go up there, and if they will tell me how much money I owe them, I do not argue. I give them that. I pay them. Here you go. And then I take my shit out and put it in the car. That's the fucking customer's part of the contract. The merchandisers, the merchants part of the contract is to goddamn take the shit that I want to buy and tell me how much it is. Can you find fault in that logic? I agree with you. And in a perfect world, there would be no self-checkout. I agree. It's quicker then, without it. Then why, as I mentioned to... It doesn't even work. It should work, is my point. Yes. But as I mentioned to one of the employees wandering around stocking shelves that nobody was buying anything off of while we were standing fucking 30 feet deep in, in, to one fucking checkout lane, I said, is it possible to call back up here? Oh, I could check with the manager. Okay. She walks 10 feet and she asks some lady at the next checkout line that's doing something in her cash. Are you open, Ethel? Oh, no. Oh, sorry. And that was the extent of the effort. So I went through the goddamn self-checkout and I told the guy standing there what I thought of his company while he was trying to get me out of there as quickly as possible because I was beginning to rouse the rabble. What did you say? What did he say? I said, why in the world have they got all of you standing around here watching us do this ourselves when you could be at the goddamn line doing it? And everybody's day would go quicker because we are not professional fucking supermarket employees. And he was just trembling and going as fast as he could to get me out of there. He said, what are you, some kind of tough guy? No, actually, this, this poor fella... <laughs> He seemed like, I, I actually told him, I said, I'm not going to hit you. <laughs> but, That's always reassuring to hear, well, I'm yeah, sure. I, I wanted to let him, because he was real <laughs> nervous. I wouldn't let him know. It was not going to be, I'm not blaming you. I said, but you can certainly tell any representative of your employers that you care to. I'm not going to hit you, but the door is open for anyone else. Well, the, I still wasn't done checking out. <laughs> well, what the fuck? That's like you go to the, go to the goddamn landscaper and say, I'd, I'd like a bunch of fucking trees. And then you got to goddamn go dig the holes and fucking plant them too. What the fuck? You think it's something corrupt? Like the makers of these machines have deals with the large supermarket chains where you carry our machines, you cut down on your workload, we give you a cutback? Well, I don't care. They're already making enough money in other ways. There, there should be at least a minimum of a, maybe we should run on that platform. The, the customer merchant contract that the, as long as the customer fulfills his part, the merchant has to actually goddamn be responsible for telling you how much you need to pay and fucking helping you correlate your fucking goods and get them out of the fucking store. I think that's the least we can ask. All right, and that's the least we could say. Yeah, it certainly is. Here for happy talk. Are we yeah. still happy? How are we feeling? I'm feeling mighty, mighty good. All right. Could have gone a couple ways there. And I, I was trying to decide till the last minute. I'm hesitant to say anything because I know you're just going to interrupt me and go somewhere else. I don't know oh, how, come much, on. how many steps I could take right now. I'm walking on eggshells. All right. All right, right. We will move forward with this I'm walking this on sunshine. Hey, hey. That's not how it goes. Hey, that was my entrance music in Dallas. That was your that was your entrance music in Dallas. That's right. Yes. All right. Well, sunshine, where are we going from here? All right. Well, Katrina will wave goodbye to the boring part of the show, <laughs> and we will move <laughs> on here. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to talk about Cornette's collectibles before we got too much further. Oh, golly, I didn't even think about it. You know, see, I should have prepared in some fashion for this broadcast today, but I, I have blissfully 
stayed away from everything for the last two days since I've spoken to you, pretty much. I heard the the main news story, and you're going to surprise me with a few more. But I should mention that, yes, the holiday season sale is in full swing at Cornette's Collectibles, where, of course, the the jewel in the crown, so to speak, is the Midnight Express... Midnight Express. The Midnight ah. Express playing power ah. slap. <laughs> The, should I do one of the clappers? The Midnight Express 40th Anniversary Action Figure Set. See? I can do it. Uh, is the jewel in the crown of collectibles, and those are still available, but going fast, you can fulfill one of your friends or family members' fondest dreams for Christmas this year by, it's too big to stick in a stocking, unless you're goddamn Happy Humphrey's nephew or something, but you can put it under their tree or whatever various part of them you'd like to stick it under. And also the T-shirts, the Cult of Cornette membership certificates uh, make everybody legal for Christmas. The Cornette face T-shirt is iconic, as you've said many times, Brian, and also available. It's on sale and iconic. And everything can be found by going to jimcornette.com where the information and photos of all the fine merchandise, the DVDs, the books, the collectibles are readily available, and the feather bottoms are waiting to serve you and your various needs, whatever they may be. And and believe me, the, if the feather bottoms around the holidays, they got no morals, no standards. They'll serve you in any way you want. JimCornette.com. All right, well, this is your show. No, it's not. This is my show. Yes, it is. And we have a lot going on. You know what, Jim? We're going to do something live here in the show that's actually going to play in the experience that we just recorded a few days ago before everything came out to address what we're about to talk about. <laughs> Let's just quickly do this. It'll wait, all... no, wait, no, wait, no, wait a minute. Hold on, hold on here. That sounds like a fucking 2007 Vince Russo TNA stipulation. Let me try to explain to the people <laughs> in English that they potentially may be able to correlate in their heads and understand. What happened was the program that we just did a couple of days ago is in the final edit to be released, and we talked about something and alluded that something might happen, and then it actually has happened before we got the program out alluding to it. So therefore, we are about now to talk about that thing, not only here, but also we are going to put a some line or bit of information of this into that show as well so that we don't sound like that we don't know what we're talking about because we did, it just wasn't public yet. Is that kind of, for the layman, what what I, I've explained what's about to happen here? I think so. As you said, we are in the final edits of the experience where we discuss this. So in order to make sure that it's not completely outdated, we're going to jump in kind of like when the Wrestle War 90 rap commercials were out there, <laughs> but then Sting got hurt. And I, breaking news, due to the dastardly injury to Sting, yeah. Lex Luger <laughs> will be taking his place. <laughs> and that way they also got to erase uh, Dr. Death from the commercial. But that's kind of what we're doing, and we'll do it right now. Hold on, let's get a, a tone. Oh, we got to get a tone. We are here with a breaking news update as you are listening. We want to make sure everyone is informed that as you are listening, we are here in the future. The great Brian Last and Jim Cornette and NXT has a new broadcast home. And that is the CW Network. The NWA appears to be shit out of luck. Jim, anything you want to say before we go back to this report? Well, actually, that's, you know, that's the thing. I can't, we've already been talking about this. And by the time we could, even before we could release the program, it has come to pass. And the NWA is, so it's, it's WWE NXT 2CW NWA F-U-C-K-Y-O-U. Did I summarize that in as brief terms as possible? As we are currently reporting, I believe so, yes. Well, there you go. Um, apparently, 
from what we are understanding, they are giving or paying, I shouldn't have just giving, they are paying uh, WWE, the CW network is, that is, uh, somewhere around $50 million. Is this what I heard? Uh, I believe so. Uh, should we now, go? Obviously, they weren't going to. They weren't going to give that much to Billy, but even if they were going to give 20% of that to Billy, that's $10 million, right? That would... Did he not just... He didn't blow the money, he snorted it. No, he didn't snort it. He ordered someone else to snort he it. Ordered, he ordered it snorted. Let's. Can we get this whole thing sorted? Do you well, have a release of some kind, or how are we going to do this? Well, back to the uh, original segment you're listening to right now here on The Experience, and we will continue here on the drive through Boy, that's loud. Let me lower that. What in the world? I do, does anybody understand what's going on here? Jim, I have a press release. This oh was sent God. out from... Don't w make me change my tone, by the way, the next time that tone comes up. WWE Communications sent this out November 7th, 4.46 p.m., two days ago as we are recording. The CW Network to become the exclusive broadcast home to WWE NXT. NXT makes broadcast television debut with five-year deal beginning October 2024. Network to air live events featuring WWE's next generation of superstars. 52 weeks a year. And Swami is going in the background. Jim, <laughs> why don't we stop right there with this initial news? And again, we had just talked about the fact that we knew for a while that CW was interested in wrestling. And it just so happens that while a lot of people wanted that spot, Raw, SmackDown, and NXT had their rights come up. And here we are. Well... <sighs> And it, there's one or two things, at least, about this that perplex me. But we we know that in the past, uh, Dave Marquez, who you know has a variety of programs under his championship wrestling banner, is on uh, a pretty good amount of CW stations as part of his affiliates, and he had been talking to these people. He's got the Car Shield thing going, but you know, Dave doesn't you know, plaster all of his intentions all over Broadway. So uh, people may not have heard about that as much, but Billy Corgan has been more than open about, oh, see, Top 20 Network, CW. And the timing of this, obviously the talks have been going on with everybody for some time. I'm wondering if Billy knew they were talking to to Nick Khan up there or whoever's doing their TV deals. But I say, obviously, the cocaine skit business didn't help them. And, ob and maybe it gave uh, the CW network a convenient excuse. But unless Billy had... A, a non-revocable, no, we're, we can't tear this up. The deal is done. Why has he gone this far in talking about it? And then just to get slapped in the face like a Monty Python skit with a fucking fish. Boom. No, we gave 50 million bucks to the WWE. And who the fuck are you? I'm sorry, wrong rock star. But you know what I'm saying? How did this come this far? The interesting thing is, I guess the order of events, Billy Corgan went public with saying that they signed a deal with a top 20 network. Then it's out there public that he said this, and then it came out that he was talking about the CW. And a lot of people said, oh, wow, that's pretty significant. Did anyone at the CW at that point say, why aren't we doing a deal with like WWE or something? Who are these guys? And then all of a sudden, the next thing they see is Cocaine Gate. Why are we doing business with these guys? <laughs> and you have a slick agent like Nick Khan or someone. V v Vince does his cocaine off camera. You know, a deal without a deal isn't a deal. And deals could fall apart real quick. That, that's, that's fucking deep, man. That's deep, man. Well, I didn't invent that line, but a deal without a deal isn't a deal. And you just have to give WWE a slight open. A slight, just a tiny opening to get in there and they'll take it. And they got, is, and by the way, this let's, we'll talk about the NWA in a moment. Let's talk about what this means for NXT. Well, yes. And that's, 
obviously it's a major increase in their rights fees from what uh, that has been, I think I saw briefly, they were getting like 15 million bucks or some estimate of that. No, I don't know that anybody has the exact figures, the way it's broken down for the NXT program from USA. If this is indeed legitimate, that's a major uh, multiple time increase. But again, we're going back to talking about broadcast television that I talk about all the time when we've done OVW deep dives or the territories or Smoky Mountain. Fans now think that wrestling has to be on national cable to, to be, you know, a big company. If they really want to grow... The, the the WWE main rosters, Raw and SmackDown, don't need any help booking a live event schedule, right? On their Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, or their whatever their fucking weekend schedule. But if they want NXT talent to really get experience, the next level up from, you know, the fucking National Guard Armory in Delray Beach, Florida, or whatever, and everything down around the Performance Center is to send them on the road and having their own television show on broadcast stations in various major markets across the country will make it easier for them to promote their brand coming to that town and give the tr the people in developmental their reps. So it could be OVW, but a national goddamn schedule, and they're being paid to do it. That's one thing. And for another thing, it still gives them a presence on broadcast television because they're going to be off Fox, at least with SmackDown, right? So now they're back on... CW is not Fox, but NXT ain't SmackDown either. So but at least the WWE maintains a presence on broadcast television in major markets around the country. So I think it's good for the NXT program, the talent, the, the guys and girls, their training, whatever, as well as establishing them as more of a third entity. And it still keeps the whole company's foot in broadcast television. What else am I not thinking about? You know, and the other thing, too, is this is a year away, October 2024. They're on a network now that's keeping WWE programming with SmackDown. So they don't have to worry about having their time slot fucked with, more than likely not. Yeah. Or anything else. This is a big deal. Let me go back to the press release here. Here's a quote from Dennis Miller, president of the CW that's, Network. It's what he's doing these days? Not that Dennis Miller. We are thrilled to welcome the WWE brand into the CW sports portfolio as they play an integral role in our mission to bring live sporting events to the network year round. WWE NXT is a perfect fit for the CW, thanks to its dynamic young talent featuring the hottest rising stars in the sport and exhilarating, unpredictable weekly events. <laughs> the passion and engagement of WWE's fan base is unmatched. And we are eager to grow that audience as WWE NXT's new home on broadcast television. Very nice comment there. Here's very, a, nicely, very nicely crafted. Here's a quote from Nick Khan. The CW has made impressive moves over the past year with its live sports programming schedule. It's a truly exciting opportunity to expand NXT's audience by bringing the show to broadcast television for the first time in NXT's history. Launched by WWE Chief Creative Officer Paul Triple H Levesque, WWE NXT has aired weekly since 2012 and features the brightest young talent in sports entertainment. Nearly 90% of the participants in last year's WrestleMania were developed under the NXT banner. Led by WWE Hall of Famer Shawn Michaels, NXT is popular with younger audiences. Ranking number one in cable primetime on Tuesday nights, last quarter, among adults, 18 to 49, and 18 to 34. Year to date, 
NXT's average viewership is up 30% among adults 18 to 49. WWE superstars such as Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, Charlotte Flair, and Becky Lynch are not on the program. Have all come up through <laughs> NXT. <laughs> And that's uh, about it from the press release here. But, you know, this is a pretty big deal for NXT. I think there's no reason why CW wouldn't give them a lot of attention. And they'll be in more homes. They'll be available to more people now. It'll be very interesting how different NXT will be in a year or two years than it is right now. Yeah, and that's what when I talk about broadcast television, because uh, a lot of people are, oh, Cornette's old-fashioned. You know, no, if you want to not only promote live events, uh, but also to reach people's homes in the in the days of cord cutting, right? If you can't afford cable, well, you can get the fucking local stations for free on a goddamn, you know, uh, uh, modern television. So it's not like anybody has to pay anything to see your local stations where you see your fucking local news and your local weather and dew points or whatever. And... CW as a network of those stations as a whole, they're not as big as five. They talk about their live sports. I would assume they don't have the NFL or Major League Baseball. Am I correct in that assumption? Well, local affiliates do. The CW11, PIX11 here in New York, they have the limited amount of local games the Mets and Yankees put on broadcast TV, which is a very small, maybe like 30 a year. Yeah, but not as part of the the entire network package. They are not outbidding Fox and and NBC Sports or whatever. No, no, it's a very those, small. It's a very. It's the smallest of the broadcast networks, and I think they have the uh, least amount of money too. Not that right, to say they but, aren't a real network or anything. Well, but. yeah, they, they they've only got fifty million to spend on this one press. No, they. But in the scheme of things, no, they don't have billions to put down. That's what it right. is. Right. In the scheme of things, they're not bidding for those level sports or even for SmackDown itself, but they can get in the game for NXT and as a network, try to draw a younger audience, as they say, to their network to maybe get hooked on some of their other programs. That's, you know, kind of the, and they could afford that. And at the same time, it's a bigger deal for the WWE than USA was giving them because WWE is hot shotted. When USA made that deal, it was, it was it was what NXT your your wrestling school on television, but now they've had a few years where they've hot shotted the fucking thing, and they've gotten the numbers up like we've been talking about, and it was worth something to a smaller entity in that respect to go over there to broadcast. So I th- I think it's brilliant. The CW can't get the NFL, but the XFL wishes they were on the CW. Yes, and there's all still a bunch of money in everybody. It's just it's the overall scheme of things and the theory of relativity. Well, that's the uh, news of NXT going to CW. Now, of course, tying in with this, as we alluded to earlier, the NWA. People were surprised when the announcement went out that they got to deal with CW. Again, we knew CW was interested in wrestling. We were surprised when it was the NWA. Out of everyone who could present stuff, it was the NWA. It was well, surprising. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and because a lot of people honestly say, "Well, Billy Corgan's a rock star," so there's doing, you know, that's one of the the perks of being a rock star is they might have just gone with his program because of who he was or whatever. Apparently not. Well, apparently not. And there's an article here from the House of Wrestling or House of Wrestling. I guess there's no the. It's just House of Wrestling. By Nick Houseman, who seems to be all over anything happening with Chicago wrestling personalities. The headline, Frustrations Growing Within NWA Over Billy Corgan's Leadership. Exclusive. Yesterday, the pro wrestling world was thrown a curveball when it was announced that WWE NXT will move to the CW in October 2024. The announcement was all the more surprising because the NWA owned by Billy Corgan, recently signed a pair of deals with the Top 20 Network. The deals were to see... In, by, by the way, interesting terminology, and we'll break it down, but recently signed a pair of deals? Go, go ahead, but let's put an asterisk by that statement. The deals were to see NWA Power and an unnamed reality show about the promotion move to the CW, likely to begin airing in early 2024. Late yesterday, 
uh, as of this story. Fightful reported that at least one NWA talent was, quote, blindsided <laughs> by the news that NXT was headed for the CW. House of Wrestling has learned that Corrigan withdrew from those close to him yesterday. <laughs> that's, that's some tortured syntax. Withdrew from those close to him. What, has there been like a fucking watch on him? We got to keep an eye on Billy? Set away to where'd he go? House of Wrestling has learned that Corrigan withdrew from those close to him yesterday and did not want to discuss the situation. As we reported over the weekend, it was Corgan's idea to do the Father James Mitchell segment at NWA Samhain, which resulted in the CW being inundated with negative social media messages. Sam Hill! About the spot. One source we spoke with at WWE gave us the impression that talks with the CW accelerated following the incident. Oh my God. They went on to say, and here's a quote, no segment ever done in wrestling has had that severe of consequences to the promotion than the Sam Hain Coke spots. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> Let's stop right there for a second. That is interesting. What single segment has ever had that big a negative financial hit on a company? Um, you know what? I'll give you a contender, but it would be cumulative. It wouldn't be all at once. It would be... WrestleMania 17, Vince McMahon hugging Steve Austin, which kind of led to the downfall of humanity as we knew it. But then it was but, the TV deal. But but no, but that, it was cumulative. <laughs> they would, they probably lost, I mean, they look at the money that they generated. They lost a couple hundred million dollars probably over five years off of that deal or whatever it is, but it's not all at once. No, this this would be the... This would be the single biggest instantaneous bomb, as Jackie Gleason used to say, we laid a bomb. I can, it's not even possible to come up with a close number two, is it? House of Wrestling has also heard from talent within NWA since our report expressing frustration with Corgan's current leadership. In the past, Dave Lagana and Pat Kenny were names that Corgan leaned on to help with the NWA's creative process and general communications with talent. Kenny is still with the promotion, but following a stroke he suffered last year. I didn't oh, my that. God. No, uh, and uh, it, you, uh, some people may know that was Lance Diamond or Simon Diamond. Originally uh, Lance Diamond. Originally Lance Diamond, but uh, I'm just saying some wrestling fans may know him better as that, but I had... I, nice guy i don't know i didn't know if he had a stroke and i'm not vouching for anything he's done the last 15 years since i've seen him but i hate to hear that he's in bad health now once again kenny is still with the promotion but following a stroke he suffered last year he was moved more into a talent relations role <laughs> what, what do they think Wait. that's where you put a stroke fit to oh my God. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna hurt myself. I'm trying to. Oh God! I'm gonna strain my milk. He had a stroke. What should we do? Put him in charge of talent relations. <laughs> End it. Get out of the way from Mr. Merkel, the blind man. <laughs> Who's that, Mr. Merkel, the blind man? He's the house detective over at the Grand Hotel. Oh my God! So. So poor he's recovering from his stroke and <laughs> uh, back back to the article. He is viewed as second in charge next to Billy, but is not at every TV taping. One source described him as the Johnny Ace of the NWA. Oh good God. And as someone you only talk to if you are in trouble or getting signed. Billy is in charge of contract offers and creative. Well, wait, no, that, all right. That's the same thing as getting signed. Maybe there's uh, some confusion over there. Due to Corgan's busy schedule touring with Smashing, or The Smashing Pumpkins, some feel he is unavailable to relay his creative ideas between shows. We've heard from multiple people who said they do not know what will happen with their booking at NWA tapings until the day of the show. 
sometimes as close to an hour before filming. One source we spoke to was... Can, can, I, can I pause to ask a question and make a comment? Yeah. Number one, what is his... I know that Billy Corgan does Smashing Pumpkin shows. I did not know that he was in constant demand and they were incessantly touring to the point where it was it's an ongoing thing. Is that the case or is this... Well, I just saw, I actually just saw something the other day. Uh, I don't remember the dates, but like they're going to be the opening act for the upcoming Green Day tour. So that'll be a pretty significant amount of dates, I would think. Oh, good Lord. Well, in that case, then, yeah, if he's the, <laughs> oh my God, if he's the only one really running this fucking show and he's off in, you know, Poughkeepsie or whatever, uh, yeah, that would be a problem. But also uh, uh, the comment I was going to make Yes, you know, you need to kind of know your bookings upcoming. We used to know, even if we didn't know what we were doing on television, we saw who we were booked with in the house shows and the arena events for a month out. So we kind of had a direction of what, and stipulations, if any. So we kind of could figure it out. We used to show up an hour before television. Here's what you're fucking doing. Let's figure out a finish. Okay. That wasn't unusual in in our day, but in the era of television where more people are involved from a technical aspect, even when I did the first taping that uh, they were goddamn did in the studio four years ago, right? We had a production meeting at, I want to say, three o'clock in the afternoon for a 7.30 show where by the end of that, at 4, 4.30, we already knew pretty much what was happening unless somebody came in with a broken leg. So I don't know what kind of fucking slipshod bullshit they're doing these days, but the, the answer needs to be somewhere in between, fuck, my bell, the bell's going to ring in 45 minutes, I got no idea what I'm doing, and, oh, the goddamn booker is on tour as a rock star for the next two months, figure it out. There needs to be a happy medium, but I'm sorry I digress. One source we spoke with was empathetic to Corgan's struggle to balance his music and pro wrestling careers, but they are hopefully puts a team of creative people around him to help filter his ideas. That's what you want as the boss. You want your wrestlers saying they hope you get someone to filter your ideas. That's what they're saying about Tony. Know, well, yeah, okay, I'm sorry to be picking this thing apart, but here's the thing. Bless him if he has the ability and the the opportunity to go out and, and tour as a rock star and etc but it's selfish if he's not put people in place to run the thing to hand it. jerry jarrett got in the construction business he handed off the fucking booking and the general managing to randy hales or lawler or whoever it was at the time or you know if you don't just say figure it out guys I'll, I'll bop in and out every now and then or you know whatever and then go off on the road it's selfish not to leave a, a structure in place for all this shit to be done while you're gone. It's too much. House of Wrestling was also told that several NWA contracts are set to come up in June and that Corgan intends to start conversations to re-sign many of them in February. Some of those talents are frustrated by Corgan's leadership and are already looking for other places they can work when their deals are done in hopes of not having to re-sign. WWE announcing a deal to bring NXT to the CW next year has not helped with how talent feels about re-signing. <laughs> now, this is interesting. House of Wrestling has also heard of Corgan giving various talent tests, and that's in quotes, to see how they react and to prove their loyalty, which has not been well received. Examples of tests were things like making, again in quotes, over Talents who come in to work lose right away just to see how they react. Or <laughs> for Corgan to be overly critical of a talent who has done nothing wrong to see how they take it. Let me stop right there. Again, to be fair, we don't know how many people's uh, point of view that is. It could be one person's, but... Oh, I was about to say, that sounds very interpretive. Yeah. And it sounds like one side that you're talking to, but here's the thing. The the concept of bringing in somebody that's quote-unquote over 
and then beating them to check their attitude is stupid to begin with because if you're not sure of their attitude, I've found through experience in some cases, you probably shouldn't bring them in to begin with. And it, if it's a guy that you're bringing in that you plan to use in the middle even, it's just dumb booking to beat them their first few appearances before the public in your company or elsewise you've doomed them to be irrelevant or preliminary material as we've seen with Tony Khan numerous times. So, you know, but then again, a lot of wrestlers will say, well, you know, I'm over, but he brought me in and beat me. Maybe, you know, you were over somewhere else, but you weren't in his plans. That's something to be said also. The problem is when a lot of people start griping about a lot of things that Billy's doing, there's something to apparently some, if not more of it. And nothing's paying off. And there's and they're not getting anywhere. They just they, they're not only not getting anywhere. They just fell off the fucking, you know, trapeze. Well, also uh, I'll end it with this. There's a long, I'm not going to read this, but there's a long thing. House of Wrestling reached out to the NWA World Heavyweight Champion EC3 for his thoughts, and he sent the following response, which he requested we print in full. Wait a minute. He, he, they wanted he, EC3's thoughts, and it was a long document. I find that hard to believe. It's so long, I'm not reading it here on the okay. air. Okay. But I'll end with this from uh, the report. It was also pointed out to us that most of the NWA talents under contract are younger, usually less than 25 years old. We are told that the NWA signs younger talent to deals because Corgan would like first dibs on these wrestlers before they get big and does not want to see them booked to lose in other promotions like AEW while he is working with them. Older stars who work for the promotion are less likely to be put under contract because Corrigan does not have the same investment, and those talents can work elsewhere and take on outside opportunities. Well, but there's another way of looking at that, too. And that way is, yes, it is a sound business strategy for Billy Corgan to sign up guys who have no other TV options and say, Hey, I'll put you on television and I'll pay you like shit, but I'll put you on TV. And a lot of wrestlers are going to take that that can't get on TV anywhere else. That's not dumb business on Billy's part. If you really believe in yourself or you have any other options, it may be dumb business on your part to take it, but instant gratification for the young. But uh, another way of looking at it with the veterans is, they wouldn't be there to begin with if there were restrictions being put on whatever else they could do in, in large part, because if you do have other options or you have a name or you are in demand with other places, he apparently either does not want to or cannot or is not, with the exception of Aldous, who he had exclusively and paid well for that period. He's not signing guys up that are names or can be utilized on top elsewhere. And I can understand him not wanting these guys to go do jobs on AEW because then how does how does that make him look? If the fucking clowns over there can beat my guys, what the fuck? He worked with them at one point, right? When Thunder Rosa first came in, she was the NWA women's champion. I it's not my week to watch all those people. I haven't kept up with it, but yes, there was some element of cooperation. Apparently that didn't go well either. I don't know. But it's it's it, what he's doing for a promoter is not is not a bad thing. It's just that he has at this point apparently not a lot to offer those people in return for him doing the right thing for his promotion. All right, well we will uh stay up to date and see what happens with the NWA and their future. I wish they had someone like Sam Mushnick to Come I just still I just up. still want to know how the how the publicity got this far. I think I said it earlier, I'll end with that and then you can talk about Sam, but um how did it get this far that it was printed as of, of an imminent happening Billy Corgan reality show NWA on the CW hip hip hooray and suddenly whoosh, 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 nope reversal went behind him can't a deal with a what did you say a deal within a deal is still it's a dream within a dream a deal without a deal more? a deal without a deal isn't a deal saying you have something about to be signed or something signed or something in a deal memo stage is not the same as having a finalized executed contract 
And I would love to find out the timeline uh, in, in some, so when they write the history books, I'd love to get the timeline on all this and how the horse left the barn before the thing caught on fire. But nevertheless, you were talking about Sam Muchnick. Well, I was just going to say that the NWA, it's too bad they don't have someone like that there who could, uh, you know, fix things or help things or make things better, but we'll see where they end up. And uh, they're certainly on a path. We could say that. Jim, I was going to give you an update on Alexander Hammerstone because he put out a video explaining what's going on and he has taken down the video. So I guess, <laughs> I guess court's attorney, uh, wife or whoever got in oh. touch and said, take down that fucking video. <laughs> I don't know for sure, but we'll you see. Know, if, I, uh, I saw, I saw somebody, I'm not taking credit for it, but I don't know who the guy was, but somebody on the internet said, boy, a lot of these MLW wrestlers are in contempt of court. <laughs> that's funny ah. imagine how they feel they can get him on the phone but you know jim when you're looking at an alexander hammerstone and decisions he has to make now for his career or yes whether, you, whether you're looking for any of the wrestlers in the nwa and the decisions they're gonna have to make for their career yes one decision that should be easy is what is the most comfortable most nice, most nice, nicest clothes <laughs> that I can wear. And of course, we could tell them where to get that nice wear. And that's from our friends at Marine Lair. I see what you know, you're a, you're, you're a poet there, Brian. You're a poet and don't know it, but your feet show it because they're long fellas. Mama Cornette used to say that every time I would rhyme something. And the folks at Marine Lair for Shayer. They are the best. Marine layer. And we're not talking about the United States Marines. We're talking about Marine as in Marine life. Maybe the people at Marine layer, the ones that own Marine world, where we can see, no, we can't see the whale anymore. Didn't the killer whale get eaten by the giant squid? Nevertheless, folks, the folks at MarineLayer.com won't sell you no squids or no octopi. They will sell you the finest wearing apparel that you've ever had, the most comfy plush, soft, cuddly t-shirts and overshirts and just all kinds of clothing and apparel, all the cozy layers that you want for the cooler season. You know, Brian, as a formerly fat person, I'm over here, I'm freezing now in cold weather. Used to have the giant layer of fat to keep me warm. Now I need comfy, warm, fuzzy stuff, and that's what you're getting from marinelayer.com. Not only that, but I mentioned that wonderful travel bag that I got from them. They have all the accessories. They've got an amazing selection of different things that you need to live your daily lives. And again, boy, howdy, are those t-shirts just as soft as a puppy's belly? You got, you, you've been spending money yeah. and that's, that's rare for you with these fine folks. No, literally every cent they've given me, I have put back into buying their clothes. I really like it. Suzanne likes it. I told her and the kids to go look through their page and see what they like. We don't get to use the promo code because we are the actual show, but we like their stuff. We're supporting it. Wait a minute. We don't get to use the promo code? No. Only the listeners do. We don't get to. No. Hmm. Well, I, 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 I think I've figured out a way to do it, but nevertheless. What? Um, have you ordered the Marge size yet? You asked me this the other day. I've not made an order since two days ago, specifically in a size that I wasn't going to order between medium and large. I want you, because I can't wear a Marge, because I'm not in between medium and large. I'm in between, well, I'll never, yeah. nevertheless. What you are you in between? I'd like yeah, to know. Well, yeah. a rock and a hard place right now. But uh, I want to see the Marge label. I want you to take a picture of it, because that's a size between medium and large that they feature at Marine Layer for the folks that are just a little bit scrawny, but not all the way minute. And if you buy any three tees from Marine Layer, you automatically get 20% off. So you can get one for you. And if you got two more, well, if you can find two friends, you can make them happy, too. If you don't have two friends, well, just change your clothes more often. You just Filthy buy some bitch. Well, buy yourself more. You, I mean, most people buy more than one shirt when they buy shirts. Well, you should wear more than one shirt because sometimes, you know, the fabric can grow into your skin and then you get bed sores. But not this stuff because it's too soft. Not this stuff, no. But you need, still need to change it once a year or so. They don't recommend you wear any of this clothing more than 365 days in a row before it's washed or you're washed or 
or you're shit out of luck. Wash your clothes, ladies and gentlemen, just like you yes. would if you were a normal person. Yes, that's that, we're always in favor of washing clothing, and this clothing will stand up to washing, but it's already as soft as if you washed it a million times, but it hasn't been washed a million times. It'll come to you in its raw form, and it'll still be comfy. So again, folks, I think we can all admit... That's right. That we can all admit... That's right. <laughs> we can all admit... That's right. The perfect T can be hard to find, but not if you know where to look. And that's looking no further than Marine Layer. And right now, besides the old, if you buy any three T's, you get 20% off. You're also, if you go to MarineLayer.com, for a limited time, 15% off everything with the code JCE15. And that's at MarineLayer.com. M-A-R-I-N-E-L-A-Y-E-R. The code's JCE15. You get 15% off your entire order. For heaven's sake, at the buy three, 20%, 15%, just, just get one of each. They'll all be comfy. They really are like the best shirts. <laughs> I'm going to buy yes. more. I got a uh, jacket from them the other day. It's the nicest jacket I've ever, you know, just bought from a website. It's beautiful. And it's, I don't know how they make that stuff so soft. It must be spun from unborn virgin goat's hair. I don't think it's that. I think it's perfectly legal, humane, normal ways that we do things, and they are fine, <laughs> and you should do things in their fine shirts. Marie yes. Lair. Do things in their fine shirts. That should be their tagline. What kind of things should you do in their fine shirts? Well, you should pluck the hair out of those unborn virgin goats. Well, that again, that's not what they do, but you can do lots of things in their fine clothes. One more time, Jim Marine Lair. What's the promo code? MarineLayer.com, promo code JCE15, which is kind of a code for 15% off the entire order. That's right. And Jim, as we're moving on, it's kind of a, not really a follow-up, but it references something you brought up a little earlier in talking about the NWA and complaints about the booking process. We didn't talk about it. This has happened a couple weeks ago. A Twitter account, Wrestle Purists, tweeted out a Dave Meltzer quote from Observer Radio. If you follow AEW, you know that a lot of stuff is being decided at much later periods than previous. Guys are getting their information on what they're doing later, and decisions are being made later. That's just how it is. There's times the day of the show, sometimes you don't even know <laughs> what plans are. It's almost at times like we used to talk about WWE, which is also very frustrating for talent. A lot of guys have a lot of input on what they're doing, so they're doing stuff, but they don't really know a long-term direction. And Jerry Lynn replied to that, because wrestlers and God knows who else have and continue to leak info to the sheets, podcasts, etc. So, Tony tries to keep things confidential. You wouldn't want to know everything before you see a movie. Anyone who leaks info is doing damage to the product and the industry. So what are your thoughts on Dave's report about what's happening with frustrations amongst talent and Jerry Lynn, an AEW producer, agent, whatever he is, his response? Well, his response was very valid uh, to a normal situation. Both of these things can be correct. There is probably chaos. We uh, we have heard that they, we've seen the evidence of there is much chaos and wondering and second guessing and whisper campaigning and all that stuff going on backstage at AEW and amongst the, the and a lot of them don't know either what they're doing or where they're going. It's obvious. And at the same time, unfortunately for a guy like Jerry Lynn, who's been in the business for 35 years, he just looks like, you know, Dorian Gray, and there's a horrible picture of him in the attic. It's sad that he sees both big stars and preliminary guys just going out and fucking talking about all the shit they're, they're doing and they're going to do and they want to do and it'll be great if they do do. And that's ridiculous also. So, uh, unfortunately, they're not running a tight ship backstage at AEW 
But if they did have more organization and were telling these guys even further out, we'd all know about it even further out because they can't keep their fucking mouth shut. Well, the only problem with all this, and again, he's responding to Dave, what booking plans were ruined by stuff getting out? Well, it, there's nothing There's nothing ruined. It wasn't that good to begin with. I'm not saying they said, oh, it got out. We had to start from scratch and scrap that. It's just that everybody pretty much knows, except for the shit that they don't even know is going to happen until it happens. But, but what everybody I'm saying knows what's going on over there. What I'm saying is what Jerry Lynn is saying is not wrong on its face. The idea right. that stuff gets leaked is kind of what ruins the mystique of pro wrestling. Yes. It's why The Observer was what it was when people first saw it in the 80s and 90s. Like, holy shit, look at what's in this thing. Yes, but for them... That's not an AEW problem. For anybody to use as an excuse for the lack of forethought and long-term booking and or sensible shit that, well, we don't want to tell them, unfortunately, they don't have anything to tell them. So, and, and then... But for Dave to be the one to point it, point it out, is it like Cronkite when he went to Vietnam and came back and said, this, this is not a good war? And Johnson said, well, if we lost Cronkite, we lost America. If we've lost Uncle Dave, have, have they lost the war? It's going to be one of the interesting things to watch for the next year. Dave doesn't have as much influence with Tony in terms of Tony just doing what Dave wants him to do. And also at the same time, Tony is losing Dave and the smart fans, and he knows it. So while Tony's chasing ratings, he's chasing the love of the audience he once had. And he's not, you know that, and he's not making anyone happy in the process. This is a better television show. The synopsis, can you say again what you just said in those words? I don't know. What did, what did I just say in That's in the perfect words? And while don't, Tony has lost Dave, Tony is chasing the love of the audience <laughs> he once had. That's the synopsis for a fucking hit television program. You see, that's the problem, though. Tony right now is chasing the ratings that there's an ebb and flow every year, and especially with whatever's happening in television, but also AEW is just not as hot, not as popular, not as must-see as it once was. The good stuff and the bad stuff on that show, you had to see it. Now you don't mind missing it. He's chasing the numbers because he needs a television deal or to make his television partner happy. And at the same time, the audience that was always there, the audience that attacked the Cornette listeners, said that they were out of touch because they didn't ignore booking holes because we got a good match at the end. Now they're realizing the booking holes that we pointed out are now giant fucking potholes. <laughs> We pointed them out when they were first starting. Those little holes. Look at that little hole in the street. That's going to be a giant pothole. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. They're doing a great job. Oh, that was a giant pothole. And now you're all getting fucking pop tires. And AEW is becoming the Corvette Museum in Bowling Green, Kentucky. For the people in that area, that's a fucking snot blower. What does that mean? A sinkhole opened up a couple of years ago underneath the Corvette Museum in Bowling Green, Kentucky, where they make the Corvettes, and it swallowed up about $2 million worth of rare prize Corvettes oh right down in the goddamn cave. <laughs> Kentucky is built on top of fucking a cave system, Mammoth Cave, for fuck's sake. Well, the Corvettes ended up in the cave, or at least the sinkhole. Well, we'll see if AEW can get themselves out of the sinkhole, but I don't know if leaking the booking and the storylines and anything like that has been a problem that has hurt AEW at all. I th actually, I think it's probably, it's probably better that they know so they can brace themselves for what's coming up rather than seeing it and being disappointed and shocked at the same time. We don't want it getting out. Let's not announce Omega versus MJF until right before the match. Perfect. Well, Jim, let's stay on the topic of AEW Collision. I have here the AEW Collision ratings for November 4th, 2023. Again, we didn't watch this. You didn't think anything really we, pulled you in. We finally just said, oh, my God, we can't. We had the pay-per-view and all the other stuff going on. But did, did everybody else share our sentiment? November 4th, 2023, AEW Collision on average was watched by 366,000 viewers. Oh, Jesus Christ, on a cracker? What, was this the World Series? I thought that was over. No, the World Series is over. What was against this? The fucking moon landing? 
There was nothing special, I don't think, really against it. A gypsy curse? This may be a lineup issue. I, I don't know. But let's go to the uh, quarter hours. These were compiled by WrestleNomics. Quarter 1, 8 to 8.15 p.m. Backstage promos. A.R. Fox swerves Strickland backstage angle into A.R. Fox versus Str- Str- I can't speak! <laughs> and the windows open versus Swerve Strickland through picture-in-picture picture ads. 395,000 viewers. Boy, howdy. What? All right. Quarter 2, 8.15 to 8.30 p.m. The Mogul Embassy FTR Fox Ricky Starks Big Bill LFI House of Black Live Angle. Oh my God. <laughs> that is a lot of people. We don't even know what happened. That is just, oh my God. Count the, count the people. Mogul Embassy. Now, I don't know if that means, that means Swerve Nana. Swerve Nana. And the other guys? Let's just say, give, give them one more. And one more embassy. So Who one, else? One of the gates of uh, embassy. Uh, yeah. Fox. Uh, AR Fox. Right. FTR. And there you go. That's six. Ricky Starks and Big Bill. Eight. LFI. That's LaFuckers and Goobers. <laughs> that is indeed them, yes. And there's four of them, right? Uh, four, three and a manager, but he's pretty physical, so four. Uh, he's a fucking breathing human being, so it been now 10, 11, 12. I got to think how many times I've bent these fingers back over at 12. And finally, the House of Black. And there are 15 and, and a woman. 15 people and a woman. I don't remember so, if the woman was involved in the angle here. What did that rip snorter well, do? I didn't see this, so I don't even know. No, I'm saying what what viewership did Oh, no, no, that, that was just the beginning of the uh, quarter. Oh, that was just the beginning of the end. Then we have an MJF and Bullet Club Gold backstage promo, uh, I guess package, I don't know, an ad break. And then Kip Sabian and the Work Horsemen, uh, they did a backstage angle leading to... Uh, leading to nothing, I guess. Roderick Strong and the Kingdom ramp promo, and then the Kingdom versus the Crucible. <laughs> what the fuck is the Crucible? Followed by a Christian video. This is all one quarter. Okay, wait a minute. The Crucible was followed by a Christian video. Are we are we watching Sermon Nap? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, well, we're watching. Is Benny, is Benny Hinn the new play by play guy? I don't know if Benny Hinn ever did numbers like this. 352,000 viewers. Ouch. And uh, I, I don't know what to say so far, but go ahead. Well, quarter three, the Mark Briscoe FTR backstage angle. Followed and by Mar Poor Mark Briscoe is mired into all this. Followed by Lance Archer versus Darby Allen with picture in picture and the post match with Jake Roberts bringing out his new stable, The Righteous. <laughs> Wait a minute now. The the Righteous was Vinny and uh, Vincent rather and uh, the big fella. What was his name? Uh, I can't remember. But the uh, point is, uh, Vincent did the kind of the leading and the snapping the fingers and leaned on the big fat guy and did the talking and. Know what I mean, man, or whatever the fuck. And now they got Jake, 70 years old, carrying an oxygen tank around with him. He's going to inject new life into those motherfuckers, of course. I wonder what's if the, the, what's the. Well, well, I'll let me give the number here. Uh, yeah, that's what I said. That was the uh, 377,000 viewers. And it picked up. Holy God. What are you more interested in seeing? The Kingdom versus the Crucible or the Righteous versus the Crucible? <laughs> I I think we need to have a, a three-way and see which religious sect wins. Well, we'll see who won here, quarter four, 845. And by nine. the way, let me oh. just make, make note of this. My God, at this point, go back to the Ring of Honor internet pay-per-views that we were doing in 2010. We had bigger name stars. Then on this national television program. Quarter four, 8.45 to 9 p.m. The Chris Statlander, Willow Nightingale, Sky Blue backstage angle. <whistles> An ad break. The Alex Abrahante swerve backstage angle. Followed by the Billy Gunn and Acclaimed. Wait, wait, swerve beat up Alex? Followed by Billy Gunn, the Acclaimed, and MJF's live promo. 
364,000 viewers. I think that may have been MJF on like uh, on the video screen. I don't know if he was there. Yeah, extricate him, distance him from this in some respect, because he still lost lost viewers for an MJF segment. Well, the big nine o'clock hour is next, Jim. Quarter five, nine to nine fifteen p.m. Billy Gunn and the Acclaimed versus Dalton Castle and the Boys. Oh boy! With picture in picture ads. Andrade El does, Idolo. Does Dalton Castle ever team with anybody but his boys? He's just always there with his boys right in his hand. And do they have managers' licenses? Because when they're not teaming with him, they're just running around ringside causing trouble. But uh, back to this segment here. Yes. The Andrade El Idolo backstage promo, followed by Mark Briscoe and Naturally Limitless which is Keith Lee and Dustin Rhodes. Oh, good God. Versus Kip Sabian and the Work Horseman. <sighs> Kip Sabian is still getting a check. Can you believe that? And naturally limitless. Tony needs to set some limits on his fucking Colombian marching powder intake. Numbers, please. Uh, That was... 376,000 viewers. 376,000 viewers led the big parade. And uh, apparently from the overall average, we're looking to, to go downward from here. Well, quarter, what is this now? Six. Six. 9.15 to 9.30 p.m. Mark Briscoe and Naturally, I can't even say it. Naturally Limitless versus Kip Sabian and the Work Horseman continued. An ad break. Mark Briscoe's backstage promo, and the start of Emmy Sakura versus Willow Nightingale <sighs> with picture in picture, 363,000 viewers. It's a miracle they only lost 13,000 of the piss poor pool that they had to begin with, but they're, you got to give them credit for stability after the initial drop. They're, they're right in the pocket there, but they've got a, a little ways to go. A little ways to go here, too. Quarter 7, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m., the continuation of Emmy Sakura versus Willow Nightingale. The Samoa Joe Keith Lee backstage angle. An ad break. And the start of Ricky Starks, Big Bill, and the Gates of Agony <laughs> versus FTR and LFI. Oh, good Lord. 346,000 viewers. <sighs> So they begin the main event and lose another 17,000. And finally, quarter eight, and there's a uh, one-minute overrun here. Quarter eight, the continuation of Ricky Stark's Big Bill and the Gates of Agony versus FTR and LFI with picture-in-picture -picture ads. 354,000 viewers. However, a one-minute overrun featuring FTR, House of Black, Claudio Castagnoli, oh, and Wheeler Yuta. <laughs> And that did 410,000, so they picked up a lot in 60 seconds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I attribute it all to the amazing finish they were in the middle of. <laughs> so they started with the largest audience, 395,000, and they were between 346 and 377 for the rest of the program. And at what point does... does uh, I mean, weren't they doing better numbers on this network with reruns of movies that they weren't? Let me ask you something. Based on what I just told you, just who is here on this show? Who's the top star on this show? I don't have any idea. Right, usually whether you like the person or not, like people weren't big fans of John Cena, you knew he was the top star on Raw for years. Who's the top star on Collision? Who's the big star on the show, just in general? Who's the big star yeah, on the show? Three months ago, you knew who it was. It was Punk. Yeah. And then one would think that, even if nothing else by process of elimination, the world champion would be the biggest star of the company, would be the biggest star on the program, but he was barely there. And you've got a bunch of, I mean, indie fucking guys on national television. But Jake is going to make that team, I'm telling you. I don't, I don't know what their fucking 
you know, uh, cutting paper dolls were and everything. I think they were probably being given too much religious freedom or creative freedom or whatever and not produced well, but they had some, they were trying. They had some level of charisma to them, with the, especially the way Vincent was acting in such a bizarre fashion. Yeah. You could you could mold something out of that, but Jay, I'm, and this is not even knocking Jake, but how is this 70-year-old, because he's got a, a uh, reputation for being an evil person in real life or whatever, being into the dark things, whatever, doing the promos. I drink my piss. He drinks his piss. How is he going to lend any kind of, anything that he hasn't done before for anybody else to this particular team, and he's more than twice as old as they are? You know, the other problem is, whether it's Jake or anyone else, I'm never a big fan of having managers that tower over their wrestlers and almost everyone jake would tower over he's like six five or six six i mean before any hip surgeries or whatever he's had done yeah well i we'll just think by, by this time next year he'll be in a wheelchair and they'll be towering over him because it, it's just it's the same thing tully didn't work with ftr arn didn't work with whoever arn was with um everyone. with code with cody it made sense at the at the first it made sense because of the anderson rhodes family although he still didn't do anything Arn, at that point they didn't let him but then it, it tony khan loves his childhood heroes and wants to figure out a way to put him into this but again i was the one that was behind the times and in the 80s and i booked all these guys to be legends and get plaques and be a special partner every once in a while as six man not fucking carry the fucking companies am i am, am i overstating this not i mean what are you overstating that tony doesn't know what he's doing i mean that's really well, no, the only no, thing I mean, it is am I, am, I, am I overstating that i did not rely on fucking ancient talent to actually carry the weekly broadcast of whatever promotion that i was bringing legends into they were as as attractions or special occasions or ceremonies or the occasional multiple person match where you know it, 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 not to just have the whole population be over fucking 50 well jim uh, before we move on from ratings as we talk about people over 50 I guess we could talk about the youngest audience they just talked about in that press release. Just for the record, NXT this past week, November 7th. I don't know if they had any main roster talent on the show. 794,000 viewers. And that is... They're picking up steam. Yeah, and that's uh, that's the dynamite number on Wednesday night, minus, you know, 30 or 40 with what they've been doing lately. Uh, dynamite on Wednesdays has been doing in the 8... 3850 range except if they of course that's for an overall average certainly not what they end up with but NXT is at that level so now the third program for the WWE is doing it the same or close to the same number as the flagship program of AEW AEW's secondary program is doing less than half the number of WWE's third program. And is Rampage now being broadcast with a projector on a barn wall somewhere in fucking East Tennessee? Has Collision gone below Rampage yet? Where are they each? I mean, hold on, I'll answer that right now. Well, you're the one reading all the numbers around here. You're the numbers guy. You're you're getting fucking information that put out by Thurston Howell III over at the WrestleNomics and all that stuff, so you tell me. I'm looking for Rampage here. I see Collision. I see Raw. Hold on. Let me go to this. Did they cancel it and we didn't notice? AEW Rampage, November 3rd, 2023. TNT was watched by 298,000 viewers. Youch! Hold on, let's just do this lineup real quick, because I don't know what this is. We have videos on our YouTube channel now that are kicking the shit out of that. Quarter 1, 10 to 10, 15 p.m. Penta El Zero Miedo versus Commander versus El Hijo Del Vikingo <laughs> with Picture in Picture, followed by a Sanjay Dutt, Jeff Jarrett, Jay Lethal backstage promo. 282,000 viewers. Good Lord. It, well, at least they got, they're going to go up. Quarter two, 10.15 to 10.30 p.m. Ortiz backstage promo. 
Uh, once again, these were compiled by WrestleNomics. Christopher Daniels and Matt Seidel versus The Guns. The Guns Live promo. RJ City and Danhausen backstage. An ad break. Soraya, Ruby Soho, Angelo Parker, and Matt Menard's backstage angle. Two hundred. Maybe you think those two girls beat those two guys up? 293,000 viewers. Well, see, that's a ratings hit. Talking about ratings hits, quarter three, 10.30 to 10.45 p.m. Marina Shafir versus Sky Blue. Ooh. With picture-in-picture -picture ads, a Darby Allen video, an ad break, and a Daniel Garcia, Trent Beretta video. 319,000 viewers. Good Lord. Well, something must have happened at 1030. Maybe some people got their electricity back or something. Yeah, Sky Blue had her fanny on TV. That was ah. also the high point for the youth demo, 159,000 viewers. <laughs> and finally, quarter four, 1045 to 11 p.m., the main event, Trent Beretta versus Daniel Garcia with picture-in-picture -picture ads. That seriously was the main event. And a Garcia Live promo, 297,000 viewers. Well, at least, hey, when you said Garcia live promo, I'm thinking, my God, could it have been a mass casualty incident and everybody turned it off, but at least they only lost uh, 30 to 22,000. So it can be worse than collision because Rampage is. At, uh, again, at what point does the network wonder, what, what the fuck are we trying to buy here? Well, Jim, let's uh, get some classic wrestling content right now. We'll come back maybe for a thing or two in the contemporary category later on. A thing or two. A few weeks back, we played some audio, and I'm going to some stuff here right now, of Roddy Piper and the Tonga Kid. Roddy Piper and Jimmy Snuka leading into the debut, or the, not really the debut, but on the national stage, the debut of the Tonga right. Kid. There's some follow-up audio now. Let's play this. This is once again from the Boston Gardener leading into a Boston Garden show. October 28th, 1984, here's Mean Gene Okerlund with Rowdy Roddy Piper. All right, fans, stay tuned. More exciting action coming up in just a moment or two. The World Wrestling Federation back here in Boston at the Boston Garden. Saturday night, November the 3rd. It is coming up, ladies and gentlemen. Not that far away. It is going to be an extraordinary night that includes the brand-new Intercontinental Champion, Greg the Hammer Valentine, to be challenged by the former champion who won that belt right here in this great city in the garden, Tito Santana. In addition, in a grudge match, junkyard dog to meet Nikolai Volkov. Oh, Rowdy, Paper, uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper. Uh, later on in this program, I know that you've accepted the challenge of the Tonga Kid, and you're going to be meeting him right here in front of a national television audience. But in the meantime... He's nothing. He's garbage. He's like where he oh, comes please. from. Nothing but garbage where he comes from. Same thing with your world heavyweight champion. You're talking garbage. This guy comes out 280 pounds, and all of a sudden, everybody in Boston is standing up and cheering and talking about Hulkamania. <sighs> oh, Hot Rod walks out, and all of a sudden, everybody's booing, thinking Hot Rod ain't going to stand no chance. <laughs> After all, Hot Rod, he's the only guy. All he's ever done was, was actually destroy Jimmy Schmidt. Look, our legend. All he's ever done is actually destroy Andre the Giant. Unless someone was to sucker me, they could never get an even shot at me. I bounced the world on my little fingertips. And then all of a sudden, Hot Rod goes into Boston and he becomes victorious. I actually beat the champion, but no, you don't want to give me the belt. No, no, let me tell you something, mister. I am the boss. I'm the one that's going back in there for the rematch. Not because I won it, because the Champion wants it because I made him look like a fool. They raised my hand. I'm the first man to ever beat the champion. I am the champion, Boston. Thank you very much, Roddy Roddy Piper. I am the truth. Stay tuned. Champion. More action after this. Take his blood. Oh, but wait a minute. Hold on here. Where's my? Uh, that is a local promo for Boston. Where's my gimmick there? And. And we've talked about the local promos in the past that you stood up against the wall or the screen or whatever, and you did them over and over for each of these markets. This was not something that he was building up in his head for weeks because he was going to do it on national television. He was doing those all the fucking time. 
And Gene Okerlund is so smooth, the master of ceremonies, and gets the anticipation going for the big card, where they, on local promos, announced the matches that you would see at the event, and you actually saw them. Because that's what you paid to see, and you it was expected that you would tell the people what the matches were and then deliver them. And then Piper comes out there, and in whatever that was, 90 seconds, he fucking sells tickets and he gets himself over and people are talking about him and thinking about him and what he makes an impression. And you don't believe that, that that's somebody that some guy backstage has told him what to say. And this is all part of some carefully scripted program. You're like, what this fucking guy's out of his mind. Because you couldn't produce that. You couldn't tell somebody to do that on purpose. Because the only person who could do that was Piper. And it wouldn't have worked for anybody else but him. You know, and also they get to reference previous shows that were, again, not on TV. I mean, again, other yes. than local TV, but not on national TV. They were well, local we're, we're not, the, when they talk When we talked in local promos about last month at the Garden, it wasn't on TV at all. And it, maybe every once in a while they'd shoot an angle in the arena and they'd show two or three minutes of the match back and the tape of the angle or whatever. But you were talking to the viewers in Boston or the viewers in Chicago or the viewers in Charlotte or wherever it was. And the most dedicated of them that go that went to the matches every month, and there were still thousands of those out there in the audience of television, they knew what you were talking about because they'd seen it. And if they happened to to miss the show, they had to go to their Aunt Lola's for fucking the holiday or whatever. When you referenced it, it struck a, a pain in your heart, like, oh my God, I wish I'd have seen that. I missed it because I had to, you know, go to the family thing. I won't miss this one. And there were thousands of those people they were talking to. So it was an ongoing soap opera that you were involved in, but it wasn't stupid or overproduced or fucking fake, phony, not legitimate, lacking in passion. It and and the you watched one hour of TV every week in Boston, and you went to the Boston Garden once a month. And like I said, there were tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of people watching wrestling at one point in Boston. But there were, you know, the garden seated 16,000. They had a lot of sellouts. They were converting those people to buying tickets with those promos. Well, here is the next ad break, I guess, the promo from Hulk Hogan for the same show. And they give him a little more time than they give Roddy Piper. Let's see if he makes as much sense as Roddy Piper. <laughs> All right, fans, the biggest and the best to be part of the next World Wrestling Federation Spectacular here at the Boston Garden Saturday night, November the 3rd. I'll tell you, I am certain that Rowdy Roddy Piper, somewhat surprised at the Tonga Kid. Enough of the Gaga, I mean, Gene. That right there with the Tonga Kid is typical of what Rowdy Roddy Piper's all about. And you know, because of these kind of in incidences, his name needs to be changed from the Legend Destroyer to the Legend Killer, Mean Gene. The dude actually, I think, has that killer instinct in him, and he doesn't care he about does, winning. He, does, he does, wants well. to destroy and kill and get anything out of his way. That brings us to the point. To the point, the main issue, what's going down? Roddy Roddy Piper, the legend killer. Yes, you did defeat me. Yes, you did beat me back inside the ring in Boston. But you know something? You didn't pin me. You didn't put a submission hold on me. You took a cheap shot, dude. That's the only way you got away from the pythons. Well, you know, I've been watching Roddy Roddy Piper hit people with coconuts, take advantage of young men in wrestling business, and also try to steal our world title. And I've been doing a lot of thinking about it. A lot of thinking about Mean Gene. I've been thinking about what Mean is all about. Why I gave you that name, man. It starts with instinct. Then it goes to survival. And it goes all the way back to the beginning. You know, I've got a little bit of an attitude problem myself. i got that uh, ability to overprotect myself. And I'm going back, man. I'm going back to the way I was. I made you people a lot of promises out here about standing behind this belt like a man. Standing in the center of the combat zone with any man or human being. 
and playing it all the way fair down the line. But now, this is too valuable. This is too valuable to play by the rules. Rowdy Roddy Piper, I've been a good boy too long, man. I'm getting crazy, man. I'm getting cranked up, dude. And I'm getting ready for anything that comes with you this time. Because I know I owe you for what you did to me the last time. The way he took that cheap shot outside the ring and then slid back in. You know, it was like being embarrassed, man. I felt a pin drop. It was a thousand people. A th oh, it was like a million people silent, me and Gene. I'm getting so wound up, I can't even... Oh, I wish I could get my hands on him right now. But the whole thing is, I'm turning kind of psychotic, man. The Hulkster's a stark raven maniac. And the whole reason why is you, Rowdy Roddy Piper. I've been a good boy too long. I'm going it just the way you want it in the ring this time. I'm going to get out there, and I'm going to... Me and Gene... You, you know what he's capable of doing. You know, that's exactly... You know, I don't even know the way I'm going to handle the dude. I don't... <laughs> last time I chased him all the way back to the dressing room, tore down the curtains, beat on the door, tried to get my hands and tear his whole head apart, me and Gene. And it's been weeks and weeks. And you know... I wish Piper was here right now. Me and Gene, I just feel like even taking a bite out of your face. Oh. But the whole thing is, Roddy Roddy Piper, the world title is too valuable to give it away. That's why instinct, survival, everything there is, man, is going on the line. And you know something? I'm not going to be a bit embarrassed to answer for my actions. Because everything that I could possibly do to you, even bend a steel chair around your head, bust you wide open from pillar to post, you'd do the same thing to me. And I'm ready for you. The words of the heavyweight champion of the world, ladies and gentlemen, Hulk Hogan, to defend against Rowdy Roddy Piper, Boston Garden, here in Boston, Saturday night, November the 3rd. Don't miss it. Oh, boy, he started strong. He tripped in the middle, <laughs> and he never got his feet under him again, but he had a lot of time to fill. But uh, again, the strength of personality, though, there were all the little Hulkamaniacs were hanging on every nonsensical word. First of all, how good is Gene Okerlund? Yeah. Even the and voice. He has the perfect voice for a comment, uh, not a comment, an announcer, someone to tell you something for you to remember. He has the perfect way of delivering it. Well, and also in his own way, like Lance Russell or any good announcer would do, is when, when he heard somebody twisting, he could sometimes jump in with just a, you know, a, a reaction to something the guy had said to give the guy a chance to fucking formulate his thoughts a little better. But... And it, here's the, with those promos, you had to fill the exact amount of time because the way those were done, and, and remember in that one, at the first of it, they referenced Piper and the Tonga Kid. You had just seen that match because they knew, and I learned this when I went to work for Watts, although it, it was valid to some degree in, in the Tennessee territory, but when you had Watts' shows or the major market or the major promotion uh, syndicated programs that bicycled all over it, it might show this week in one town and that week in the next town and et cetera. What they would do is they would read the format of the television show that they were doing the li live local promo inserts for, right? And you couldn't refer to something that had not happened yet. So as it, we learned it in Mid-South. I always learned to read the formats, which Watts left on the desk at promo day. Even though we, we had already jumped him and beat him up with a blackjack or whatever at the last Shreveport TV taping, Oklahoma City and Tulsa and Little Rock, they hadn't seen it yet, so we couldn't talk about it. So in the local promos, you were taught to only refer to what the viewer had seen on television yet, or you could talk about in the abstract, what they were going to see, like uh, the big main event with so-and-so and such-and-such -and -such is still to come, but I'll tell you this. And you had to keep it straight. And these guys, they just rattled them off like that. Gene Okerlund was a master. Lance Russell was great. Jim Ross in Mid-South, the, whoever the lead announcer was, Tony Schiavone at Crockett's office. Reese Bowden. Well, I won't go that far as these guys were... <laughs> But they'd, you know, they'd read the card, or at least the main matches, and then they'd bring the guys in and out, boom, 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 and everybody, like we've talked about before, needed to be on their fucking game because if you were blowing takes, you were blowing time. If guys had blown even 10% of the local promo takes that we used to do in Charlotte, we would have, wouldn't have been out of there till fucking 5, 6 o'clock that night and still have to drive to Raleigh. So fuck-ups were rare. You just went with it. 
But that's the uh, thing is that varying times in some territories, you get seven minutes of commercial time and they would do two, three 30 commercial breaks as complete local promo interviews. They'd go on forever. Other places were like in, in Memphis, the Louisville show, they would get, I think six minutes. What they would do is they'd do a two minute baby face, a two minute heel, a one minute in the middle of Lance reading the card. And then a couple of 30 second spots mixed in. Or, you know, it could be anything in between. Crockett was the 228s. Every local promo we did was two minutes and 28 seconds because it had to exactly fit the commercial break in the tape of the show that already existed. So we couldn't just say, oh, we need five extra seconds. Well, fuck you. We ain't going to show it. So that was, you know, it was depending on the territory and the format, the way they did things. That was the local promos, and you needed to remember what you did the last time in the town, as well as where you were in the television saga. And that's why in Memphis, when I first got in the business, they did them for Louisville, Evansville, Lexington, Kentucky, Nashville, Tennessee, Jackson, Tennessee, and the Tupelo show. So what was that? Seven shows, that'd be 14 interviews. And it would take about an hour, hour and a half on a Monday night in Memphis in the locker room before the card started. It would last just stand up against the wall. And I, whether I was allowed to do interviews or not, I would get there early and go sit in the corner because I'm watching Jerry Lawler, Austin Idol, Jesse Ventura, Stan Hansen, you know, all these fucking guys do local fucking promos. So it was like, you know, just learn by example. And then, you know, Lance was so quick in his own way, but the best, I'll tell you the best blooper and we'll get off this. Lance is reading a card one night for wherever it was. And on the card, I was managing Tommy Gilbert when he was under a mask as the ace of spades, right? And I was also managing Duke Myers. And so... Lance is reading it off real quick, and he says, and it'll be Bobby Fulton against the Ace of Spades, Tommy Rogers against the Duke of Myers. But anyway, that's, you know, that's another thing. These guys, even in Ring of Honor 10, 12 years ago, I, I think I mentioned before, they couldn't wrap their heads around the concept of specifically doing a promo to sell tickets for this match in this particular place, in this particular building. Heels used to, when they'd go into a, a town every week or regularly every month, they'd get the local newspaper and they would read what embarrassed the town or what scandal was going on or how bad the sports team was doing. And that would be, you know, promo material for the next week's local promos. Yeah, your fucking sports team sucks or, oh, fuck, your mayor's a goddamn pedophile or whatever it may be. And you could get heat with that. And you couldn't use it anywhere else, but you wanted to draw money in that fucking town. You didn't care what somebody else was doing somewhere else. And there, there's, there's none of that personalization anymore. And that's why it, it just all looks kind of, you know, pasteurized and homogenized and cleaned. I'm done. Well, Jim, that's a nice transition to some other audio I wanted to play for you that I thought would be interesting to the listeners. You know, a lot of people that grew up on WWF TV watching it, not on the actual show, you were used to Lord Alfred Hayes. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Here's a small sample of Lord Alfred Hayes on WWF TV. Update this week focuses upon a finely conditioned young athlete. World Wrestling Federation Ladies Champion, the beautiful Wendy Richter. Wendy Richter now has a very firm grasp upon the title that she tore from that cast iron hold of the fabulous Moolah. <laughs> Wendy tours not only this country but the world, showing how good she is. She is capable of beating anybody. Let us see how she accomplished the task of taking the title from Moolah. In front of a capacity crowd. One, two. Oh. What happened? 
Yeah, by the way, it's nice when you go to a recap and it's literally the commentator saying, what happened? What happened? <laughs> I've got in all kinds of noises. Wendy Richter has a beguiling smile <laughs> for her friends. She can charm you with her presence, her conversation. <laughs> But woe betide those ladies who step into the ring to oppose her. Wendy has demolished all the- Well, we'll stop it there so we don't get hit with a copyright claims. They play Michael Jackson's Thrower, which they didn't pay for the rights to play originally. So it's all sorts of problems there. But that's the version of Lord Alfred Hayes that fans in the Northeast and then fans nationally got to know. Yeah, what are your, boy. <laughs> what are your thoughts on this first? Well, first of all, when he said- Broke the cast iron of, I thought he was saying, broke the cast iron whore of Moolah. <laughs> that was her nickname, the cast the, iron the whore? cast iron whore. <laughs> no. No. Um, bless, bless Lil. We loved her. That was her um, era of women's wrestling, the cast iron era. Yes. Wrestling. Yeah, there, there's the golden age, the silver age, the cast iron age. Uh, but yeah, and for everybody now who's going, oh, Cornette, you take take the piss right out of all the accents of all of the English announcers. And, and there's poor Nigel over there going, I'm screaming and I don't know why I'm on a yacht with Tony Khan. Yes. But yes, Lord Al Hayes was ridiculously campy bad as an announcer. And it worked because they knew who Lord Al Hayes was from his days as a main event wrestler. And I mean, if, the fans I here didn't this, know that. I'm sorry. The fans here didn't know that. Well, that that's right. They brought him in as an announcer, didn't they? He was known in the wrestling industry. He had wrestled and managed in other places, never anything with the WWF. So the first that's time true. WWF fans saw him was in the Garden. I think the night Backlund lost the belt, maybe. Yeah, but and and let's back up even further. Lord Al Hayes, uh, Judo Al Hayes, was a shooter. He was a judo expert in his younger days, what the late fifties, early sixties, when he first got in the business. And he was later on, through from the late sixties through the end of the seventies, really first part of the eighties with the AWA as the manager run. He was a main event guy, almost everywhere, and he was a tough guy too. And and very nice guy, but that accent, it obviously he didn't really speak like that. It was that was part of the, you know, the early 80s WWF when Vince first started forming his vision that everybody is an exaggerated caricature of their nationality or their profession or their, you know, whatever. And he was the only one, and it worked. And and bless Lord Al, he was a nice man, but Boy, that doesn't age well, does it? He was also Vince's sidekick on TNT and just a weak British man who was very kind and talked like this. Yes, Ar well, Arthur Treacher to... Who was it? Joey Bishop that Arthur Treacher was the sidekick to in the 60s? Like most of America, I didn't watch that show. Uh, well, also, like, also because I wasn't alive. You weren't alive. But the <laughs> point is, he had a British sidekick. And that's what Vince was trying to do 15 years later. Lord Al Hayes was Arthur Treacher. Was it was it was it Merv Griffin or Joey Bishop? I'm trying to think. I don't know, but here's Lord Alfred Hayes a few years earlier, 1978 in the AWA. The city about the dastardly deed of your man, Super Destroyer Mark II, and tonight the Crusher. And is he ready for this one, Lord Hayes? Let me answer the Crusher first. By his reckless actions, by his respect irresponsible behavior he brought into the ring a man who was incapable of facing us we didn't want to hurt any little midgets we didn't want to take them and strike them it wasn't our fault it was his and we warned him the responsibility was on his own shoulders all we saw in the ring were two tag team partners opposing us what happened to Lord Little Brock was the fault of the Crusher. And now then, Crusher, you are going to take on uh, Super Destroyer Mark II by yourself? I won't be into Well, there it cuts off right there, but... And Super but, Destroyer uh, Mark II is Sergeant Slaughter. Yes, Bob Remus. Um, and the presentation completely different, the tone completely different. 
and this was the evil English Lord Al Hayes that looked on Americans and the riffraff with disdain. And the match he's talking about, the Crusher got Lord Littlebrook, a midget wrestler, to be his partner against Super Destroyer Mark II and Lord Al Hayes because that's the way you humiliated the manager. Even though Lord Al Hayes had been a main event wrestler and was six feet three in those days, whatever the fuck, it was still Crusher's way, the most beloved wrestler in the AWA, of humiliating the manager. I can take a midget as my partner and beat your guy and you both. Are you disappointed it's not Little Crusher? Uh, there was no Little Crusher. Oh, there was Little it was, Bruiser. It was That's Little right. Bruiser. And he couldn't use Little Bruiser. That'd be ridiculous. Well, Little Bruiser was out of the business by that point. Because the Little Bruiser match with Bobby Heenan in Indianapolis was 1972. And we're talking, what, 78, 79 here. Why wasn't there ever a Little Crusher? I get they couldn't find another one. There was only one. One size fits all. Well, let's give out one more example, because this ties into one of your favorite wrestlers uh, ever, I think I could say. Here is from Mid-Atlantic Wrestling. I think it may be the debut of Lord Alfred Hayes with his new heel charge. Let's go to this. Alfred Hayes and uh, Lord, I understand you have an announcement you'd like to make to the wrestling fan. Yes, let me preface this by saying that sometimes uh, in various sports, somebody comes along who shines uh, a star, you might say, an example to all others, somebody who stands head and shoulders above everybody else in his particular profession. I know this. A person who has a regal, a noble bearing that places them, you could say, upon a tune. In the world of professional wrestling, we have such a man. A man of noble and regal bearing, a royal personage, in fact. I would say he is a king. King James the First of wrestling. King James Valiant. This man is indeed a royal personage who is able to beat easily anybody who comes before his throne. <laughs> Your Lordship. Thank you for this fine compliment and everything you have said. And I know the only reason you did say all this is because it's the gospel. Long live the king. Oh, James, you will live a long reign because I don't see anybody capable of even approaching you. <laughs> and as is the case in such circumstances, I always involve myself with somebody who is destined uh, for greatness. Well, there it is, Lord Alfred Hayes Woo! with King James Valiant. That was legendary for how bad it didn't work. <laughs> and no, here's the thing. That was that was 1980. Was it? Oh God damn! It was I'm 81 or 82? It was. It was. It was later in 81. And here's what happened. A couple of things. Jimmy Valiant, handsome Jimmy Valiant, when he came into Memphis in 77, it was handsome Jimmy and luscious Johnny the Valiant brothers, right? So Memphis knew him as handsome Jimmy Valiant. And he quickly got over as the top heel, and then they switched him babyface. And then he started that run where he could go back and forth because he was just, he was just over. And whatever he did, he could get heat, but still a lot of the guys liked him, and then he could switch babyface again and and get him right back, right? It was just, he was a personality. And also at the same time, Lawler was doing the King thing, and when, when you know, Lawler and Valiant were working a program against each other, Valiant would steal the crown, and then he had took pictures with the crown, and especially while Lawler was out, he got the crown from Ellering when Lawler's leg was broken. So there were those pictures floating around. And I guess who would have been, was it, it was still George Scott, wasn't it? Booking at that point in time. Oh, I don't know, actually. It may have been. May I have been. think it was. In, in 1981, I'm pretty sure it was because they didn't move to, George Scott left in 82, right? To went to work for Vince. He didn't go, I don't think he went that early to Vince. Remember, he also. Or maybe 83, because he, because he had gone down to, 
McGurk. McGurk. And killed yes. the territory. <laughs> and killed the territory there. But nevertheless, the point is, handsome Jimmy Valiant, the boy from New York City, and with his own music, son of a gypsy, the raven babyface, the wild, woo, messy, crazy guy, in Memphis was a top guy, was drawing a ton of money. And we've talked about when he went to Charlotte, he made that move when Jarrett and Lawler had bought him a house in Memphis and he turned the keys back in it and made the move because he was promised a top spot in Charlotte and a, to be a main event baby face or heel in Charlotte, you were going to, you were guaranteed to make more money than they could pay you in Memphis. So he was trying to trade up, but when he got there, they weren't plugged into what had gotten him over and tried to, go off the pictures of him wearing Lawler's crown and make him King James. And a, you heard him talking so somberly. It didn't work. It flopped like crazy. And how long did that last? It was only a few months, right? It didn't last long. And, you know, it's one of those famous things. Hulk Hogan came in as a heel to the AWA with Johnny Valiant. And before you knew it, he was Hulk Hogan. Jimmy Valiant comes in as King James with Lord Alfred Hayes. For you know what, he's the boogie woogie man. Exactly. He's the beard is back fucking wild and crazy, and he's doing the dance and clapping the hands and whoo mercy. And instead of the handsome Jimmy, the boy from New York City, he's Jimmy Valiant, the boogie woogie man. And that's what got over in Charlotte. And he was one of the singular most popular guys on the card until pretty much almost the sale to TBS all the way through 88 off of being the boogie woogie man. But King James laid a fucking turd in a punch bowl. Well, Jim, maybe we'll have a little bit more classic audio. We'll see. But before we go too much further, if only there was a network that had a lot of this stuff that was only available overseas that we had to use a link to get access to to see this amazing hidden footage. Hitting, hitting, hitting footage. This the hitting footage. The oh. footage of people hitting other people. This amazing hidden footage. <laughs> just give it up. Oh. You know, if there was just a way that we could see all the shit that we want to see without telling people what we were seeing, that sums things up. Folks, you're, you're just, if you go online without a VPN, then it's just like you're standing stark naked in the middle of your living room window with Aunt Fanny and Uncle Felcher across the street staring at your little ding -a -ling. That's what you're doing. They might as well call the cops on you for exposing yourself to the world if you don't have our friends at ExpressVPN keeping you covered. Because the internet service providers can see every single website you visit. And as a result of that, they can sell that information potentially to the highest bidder I'm pretty sure that this evidence is admissible in court. So just think of how much your wife would pay for information like this. And they will use this data to target you. You're going to have a big sniper rifle scope right between your eyes and the ISPs. Boom goes the dynamite. Your life is over. They have consigned you to Devil's Island somewhere because they have exposed you to the world as being a person that goes to the nether reaches of the internet. Not as for most of you. No, not exactly how it works for oh, any of you. A, oh, that's a, yeah, people are going to their nethers and they're reaching them. But Speak Express VPN can cover you up because I'll tell you what, they can cover all the goods and services that you've got because they will make people think that you are somewhere far the fuck away from where you're at. And then you can just do anything with impunity. You can go no. where you want to go, do what you want to do. You can move people, other people's money around the goddamn world. No, 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 no. You can hack no. the various Just stop whatever you're different... thinking. Stop. Just stop. Well, just the smaller and think about Think about whatever it is that makes you happy. Dead babies or whatever it is that makes you happy. Think about that right now. And let's talk about ExpressVPN being used. For fine yes. legal reasons, like yes. accessing fine programs from the UK. Right? Hey, if, 
the great if you can dude. use express vpn to hack into the defense systems of some smaller countries around the world it's their fault no it's, and they shouldn't hold it against you it is certainly nothing that jim is encouraging and we don't encourage it we encourage you to leave small countries alone we, we, we <laughs> isn't that right jim yes leave those poor little countries alone you big bullies we encourage you to have courage, though, when you use ExpressVPN because they can't see your online activity then. Your identity is anonymized, anonymously, anonymity, anonymized by a secure VPN server. This VPN server, he's a secure son of a gun. He's comfortable in his own skin. He comes out. He's got a towel over his arm. He's wearing a black tuxedo. And he says, hi, I'll be your VPN server. And he's a secure son, and he's going to protect you, and he's going to encrypt your data and just make sure that you zip your pants up afterwards. There's no actual physical server that's a human being. There's a physical server. It's just a real server. It's not a human being serving you cocktails or whatever it is you're fantasizing about over there. Well, we, we Snappy had pappy. We had a server the other night when we had dinner, but it's easy to use ExpressVPN. You fire up the app. Once you be careful, wear gloves because it will get hot when you set fire to it. But after you fire up the app, you click one button and then bing, 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 bing. In front of your eyes, things start changing. Neon signs start going on and off. Flashing lights. There will be some helicopters. And pretty soon you're all covered up. And you can access programs from around the world like the WWE network that they've still got over in in the other countries that they like better than us, we got to watch the cock. And actually, you can get into some cock also with the ExpressVPN because, well, they've got different peacocks for different parts of the world, right? So you can just, I, you can adjust your cock however you see fit for what you'd like to see on it. I don't know. From Bangor to Bangkok, you can use ExpressVPN to access all sorts of stuff. You can spend more than one night in Bangkok now because they won't know where you are. So again, don't let the ISPs win and don't stand in front of your picture window with Willie hanging out for the world to see. Use ExpressVPN and secure your online activities. Go right now, expressvpn.com slash JCE. Right now, expressvpn.com slash jce you're going to get an extra three months free of this protection we're talking about and as a matter of fact stacy got us the year's subscription to express vpn renewed it actually i should say the other day and changed her location fuck it's never been quieter around here i haven't seen her in four or five days what she changed her location where is she jim I don't know. Jim, That's the point. Where is she, Jim? ExpressVPN. Where is dot she? com slash JCE. If you want to change your location, they'll not be able to figure out where you are no matter what they do. I don't know who they are, but again, if you want to access fine programming that may not be available here in the States, like, for instance, the great sewing bee out of England, ExpressVPN is the place you should go or... The people you should see. Check them out. Jim, what's the promo code? I said it before. Slash JCE for an extra three months free of protection. You will not get pregnant. You'll be fully protected from your online activities. You know, online insemination is a, is a trend that's sweeping the country now. If you don't use protection. Well, your data will be protected. And there'll be no uh, pregnancy in your data being sold, whatever we're saying. Express VPN! Well, Jim, just imagine if there was Express VPN back in the early 80s. And on that topic, in the early 80s, you may remember starting, you were the first guest, I believe. Jerry Lawler had a talk show on local TV on Sunday mornings, I believe, correct? Yes, that is, you are correct, sir. It was on WMC TV Channel 5, the same station that uh, aired the wrestling program, and it debuted in. I believe it was September, October of 1983, and I'm pretty sure it ran, God, six, seven, eight, nine years, something like that. It, it was around for a while. He did local segments on sports teams. His baseball or softball team was featured. He had uh, 
obviously wrestling and you know different personalities and it was it was a wrestling kind of oriented show but that wasn't all that there was to it and he did 30 minutes i believe it was and you know lawler got numbers in memphis everybody knew who he was well here is a segment from his show here is some bloopers as they were played on the jerry lawler show oh good lord that was action from the Mid-South Coliseum, but you know, we wrestle all over the country, and of course it's impossible to be in every city every week to make television interviews about the matches, so what we have to do is film them ahead of time, and you know who you're going to wrestle, and you sit down and you think about the match, <laughs> and you think of something great to say about the match or your opponent, and then you try to do it, but it doesn't always come out that way. Let's take a look at some of these wrestling bloopers. <laughs> Coming up Wednesday night in Evansville, you will see uh, Tommy Rogers. Thank you very much. I've heard a lot about Evansville, Indiana. I've heard a lot about Adrian Street. I'm just looking forward to getting that ring with Adrian Street. You better be prepared, boy, because I'm going to give you a, uh, the rest of life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in the main event of the night, the international title is on the line. Austin Idol will be going against Ken Patera for the international belt. You know, and I can't wait till you. I can't dress the rest of And if you're lying down, then don't bother to show up in the Louisville Gardens. That dude cost me and Joey Lawler the world's heavyweight tag team titles. I'm telling you right now, there's an old saying. I can't remember what it is right now. <laughs> you know, in the 22-man battle royal, there's a lot of top guys. And Bobby Fulton, you know, I may be the... In a 22-man battle royal, you know, there's a lot of top guys. I might be the underdog going in, but... Uh, well, you know, in a 22-man battle royal, <laughs> there's a lot of men in there and a lot of top men, and there's a lot of guys least expected to win. Well, I think I'm one of them, but I just could just surprise all of you. <laughs> And we want to tell you about it, a special concert that'll have Jimmy Hart and the Gentries of the, uh, hold it out, we'll be around here in just a minute. Jimmy Hart and the Gentries with a uh, special... Hey, <laughs> well, there is a little behind-the-scenes fun there on uh, wrestling. Well, Jim, there's a well, little behind-the-scenes fun on wrestling. Hold on, I've, I've seen a couple of those clips before, and I think I was there when one of them was done. Um, <laughs> poor Bobby Fulton. This was his, really, he'd been in the wrestling business since the late 70s. He had his first match when he was like 15 or whatever, but he had not done television until he got to Memphis, and there he is 20 years old, I think. And... He's trying to be the humble baby face and, and bless him. And Tommy Rogers was not his partner then. They would later go on to be the Fantastics. And as everybody's heard, Bobby ended up being able to do a pretty good fired up promo. But they were, again, they were learning there. And I remember one of the, actually the one at the end of that with the opera singing with Lance, that was a clip from back in 1977. They saved this because Al Costello was managing Phil Hickerson and Dennis Condry. Uh, Kang, uh, of the fabulous kangaroos, Al Costello. And he was also, he had an opera background. He was a, and he would come in and do that and he'd crack Lance up. So then the one they didn't play, I guess they couldn't play it because of the standards of the time, was then there's the, you've probably seen it, Brian. Lance brings in Al Costello and the first thing Al says to Lance is, Lance, do you know the definition of a wind jammer? No, Al, what is it? That's the agonizing screams of a trapped turd. And Lance busts up and they can't air it or whatever. But uh, those were the, a lot of the ones that were done, uh, I was just talking about earlier, in the back room at the Coliseum, you know, before the matches on Monday night. And I remember Stan Hansen was doing one that he, he didn't blow it. They couldn't air it, but it wasn't like he made a mistake. But he's cutting the promo on Austin Idol and... Some people are kind of looking at the notes or seeing what's going on next. He grabbed those leather chaps he used to wear and he swung them over his head and he hit the fucking ground with them and it pow and it echoed off those cement locker room walls and everybody burst up to attention and he screamed, and Idol, you just flat pissed me off. And everybody just started laughing because who's going to tell Stan Hansen you can't say pissed off on Evansville, Indiana television in 1983. But it was, you know, great stuff. They couldn't use some of the fumfers that, you know, contain profanity. But yeah, I was the first guest, as you mentioned, on Lawler's program because they 
they forgot to tell anybody else to stick around for the heel interview segment, and I was riding by myself, and everybody else went to Nashville. So he can you hang around? Okay. So I missed I missed my lunch at New Orleans Famous Fried Chicken that day. Well, one more clip of our classic audio from the Lawler show. Here is Jerry Lawler interviewing someone who clearly recorded his end of the interview before this. Uh-oh. Here's Jerry Lawler with Jimmy Valiant. Now, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take this opportunity to find out what's been going on with some of the wrestlers who you've seen here in the past but aren't, res- or aren't wrestling here now or haven't wrestled here recently. One of the guys who uh, we're always interested in is Handsome Jimmy Valiant. Now, Handsome Jimmy, we want to know where you've been wrestling the past few months, what you've been doing, uh, a little bit about your activities. So, Handsome Jimmy, just, uh, you know, where are you and what are you doing, man? Tell us now. You know, that's a difficult question, King Fisher. I don't know why I've been myself, brother. You know, a brother asked me on the street the other day, he says, where you at, man? I says, I don't know where you at. He says, I don't know. I ain't nowhere to. Yeah. You know something else? Another guy asked me a question. He says, uh, what do you think about the world situation? I says, why don't you ask Johnny Cash? Dear, 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 do dick do Well, I see I'm wearing black. dick do dick do dick do Yeah, I wear black because of the world situation. Yeah. Another guy asked me a question. He said, hey, handsome Jim, man. I said, yeah, brother. He says, what kind of food do you eat? I said, well, yeah, I, I, I don't know, but I think if Nixon had to do it all over, he'd probably do the same thing, that Watergate thing, you know? Yeah, I'll tell you what kind of food I eat, Gene Fish. I eat anything I want to eat. I'm always going on a diet. You know, I went on a diet, two kind of diets, two diets, brother. One diet was enough to eat, you understand? A diet, I'll tell you about a diet, brother. You know something, the best diet is low carbohydrate and high protein. You know, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I've been. All I know, Kingfish, I love you, Jack. I love you to death, baby. You know something, people? I love Memphis, Tennessee. I love King Lala. I love Jared. Jared, whoo, my say. I'm in love. I wish I could kiss something right now. I wish somebody was here to kiss that. Kingfish, give me a kiss. <laughs> well, I, I hope you got more of that interview than I did. <laughs> <laughs> And that was the guy that was King James with Lord Al Hayes in Charlotte uh, a minute ago. And that's the difference. The people loved that bullshit from Handsome Jimmy. He made absolutely no sense. You couldn't write it. You couldn't understand it. It got over like a million dollars. And the fucking, when he'd come out doing his entrance with his song and everything that Jimmy Hart wrote, the kids would follow him do, trying to do his strut down the fucking aisle way, the same fucking way. It was amazing. It's context and presentation. Same guy in a different way, presented in a different fashion, in a different place, can either be, you know, it, 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 it's not even about the talent if the presentation is wrong. It's not even about the question. I remind you, the question was, hey, handsome Jimmy, where you been? Oh, yeah, well, no, but I don't know the difference between King James and Handsome Jimmy is that lit shit up. And, you know, and that's the thing is it, it, he didn't, you believed him because who could do that on purpose? <laughs> and, and it worked. Woo, messy. One, one more before we wrap things up. Here's another one uh, from the Lawler Show. Well, we're back on the Jerry Lawler Show and you know, ever since I got my own show, I've noticed a little bit of jealousy from some of the other wrestlers. I think there's quite a few of them that think that they should have their own show. So what I've done, I've gone out and given some of them an opportunity to see what it would be like. And one of them that we're going to see today is what it would be like if handsome Jimmy Valiant had his own TV show. You know, King Fish Lawler's got his own show, you know, Handsome Jimmy wasn't mind his own show, you know. I'm right out here in Overton Square, and the very first person, you know, I'm going to practice a little bit, the very first person that walks by here, I'm going to talk to. Well, here comes someone right now. How you do, sir? Well, Dave Brown. David Brown, you have a lovely daughter. How you doing, brother? How's the weather? Chilly today and hot tamale. I understand that, brother. Ask me a question, any question you want to ask me. Uh, uh I... Oh, give me a kiss. Uh, oh, all right. Feel good. Give me my show. Kingfish Lola. I want my show. My show. <laughs> well, uh, maybe, uh, I think maybe Handsome Jimmy better stick to wrestling. <laughs> there it is. One last clip from the Lawler show this week. 
Was he really at Overton Square? Did you see the video? He was backstage in front of a green curtain. Okay, well. <laughs> no. I went with him one time to do the Son of a Gypsy music video. He got this motorcycle gang in Memphis to bring all of their motorcycles and all of their women and a big old one of those big three-wheeler things that he could drive, and he had the crown with him and the leather jacket, and we're at the Memphis airport shooting video of this, you know, chaos going on, and that's when then they got him coming off the, um, you know, the the plane. I came rolling into Memphis, TWA, but we sold like a thousand color eight by tens at three dollars a piece, forty four years ago or whatever of Jimmy Valiant with the crown on, on that big ass fucking motorcycle out in the parking lot. It was, you know, they would take him all over town and people would recognize him. And you got great reactions from all these people. It's Jimmy Valiant. Holy shit. This is a weird question. Did Jimmy or did the Valiants themselves invent the, it's so stupid. Such a stupid question. The hands on the hips looking at nothing in the sky from side to side. <laughs> yeah, the look. I look to the left. I look to the right. There's nothing he's looking at. He's looking at the ceiling. Right. It's it's the it's the prancing or prancing or <laughs> preening yeah. of, you know, bleach blonde heel fucking cocky look. And I don't know if they invented it. They perfected it. And I mean, you know, that was, you see most of the pictures of handsome Jimmy Valiant, especially when he's a heel, just looking up. Well, Jim, things are looking up. This is a fun addition so far. Let's uh, quickly do something that's become a popular uh, semi-recurring segment. I have some retro wrestling figures that have arrived, and some of them have finishing maneuvers for you to guess. Uh-oh, guess the finishing maneuver. Brunch. I have the latest uh, several figures from Hastel Toys. That's a mix of Hasbro and Mattel. Hastel Toys. At least they're, they're not hostile. They're the ones who put out the uh, Fellas with a Purpose set of figures. <laughs> this one, the artist known as Savio Vega, Juan Rivera. A Juan Rivera action figure in the classic WWE Hasbro style. What would his finishing maneuver be named? Um, oh God, um, I'm trying to think what he really called it in real. I've, I've completely drawn a blank. It would be the Boricua beatdown. Okay. Then that's just something they made up because he didn't call it the Boricua beatdown. Yeah. I don't know if any of these guys called these, uh, any of the moves. Let's well, no, remember Ming had the Tongan death grip. That, that was actually a different toy line, though, that had ah, that one. Oh, see, now you change your story. Well, here I have another one from Hastel Toy. This is the new Mark Canterbury action figure in the, uh, I can't call him Henry O'God one, Hank the Farmer. Oh, God, no. No, they don't call him that. I'm calling him that. <laughs> but the new Mark Canterbury action figure in the classic Henry O'Godwin uh, garb. What do you think his finishing maneuver would be? Well, couldn't they couldn't they say something like, you know, hog farmer Hank or something where they got the hog in there? They have a bucket. He comes with a little bucket. And a bucket. A bucket, Mr. Creosote. Um, it's gotta be the slop drop, doesn't it? That was what it was, wasn't it? That was what it was. This is the farm flattener. <laughs> The farm flattener. Ladies well, you know, most farms are pretty flat. You don't see a lot of cornfields on the side of a mountain. Uh, finally, I have, uh, well, finally from the Hastel Toy uh, line of uh, grapplers and gimmicks, the new Dennis Knight action figure, known as Phineas Godwin. And he was Shanghai Pierce, right? The other one was Tex yes. Lassinger. Yes. The new Dennis Knight action figure, what would he, and it comes with a pig. <laughs> Comes with, well, comes with a free pig. What would his finishing maneuver be? Wait a minute, is it a little plastic pig? It's a little plastic pig. A little plastic pig. I assume I haven't opened this, so I assume it's what would what would penis Godwin's finish? It well, it was it was the slop drop also, but if they have they used that for are they allowed to use that again or would he be the well, they didn't use it last time. The 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 the, the pig porker. Oh well, almost close. Almost close. 
The pig pen punch. The pig pen punch. <laughs> the pig pen punch. What'd you think of uh, Tex and Shanghai or uh, Phineas and Henry? Well, they were great guys, and they were victimized by Vince's obsession with doing gimmicks at that point from his childhood that he hadn't outgrown yet. He was doing the scuffling hillbillies from 1959, but he was not he's not in any way trying to update him. Like he would he wasn't making Henry and Phineas, you know, militant fucking farmers pissed off about the state of the farming industry and the family farm coming out to fucking blood on a scarecrow or something it was still the scuffling hillbillies from 1959 with a bucket of slop and a pig they had hillbilly jim for a while too yeah and and hillbilly jim and uncle elmer you know plowboy and all of that in the 80s was vince's flashback to the scuffling hillbillies and there were certain gimmicks that he couldn't it's not that he couldn't get over he loved him or had a soft spot for him or just understood him that way and he was going to do it in every generation. All right, I have another... Uh, let me pick this up. There's no finishing maneuver here, but we're going to end with this. The uh, Zombie Sailor line of toys. The Zombie Sailor line of wrestling heels and faces. I don't remember him. What promotion did he work for, the Zombie Sailor? I don't believe he worked for a promotion, but he has a line of toys. I have to say... Amongst all the toys, these may be the most impressive in look and feel and uh, just overall, these are incredibly impressive. The new Bastion Booger action figure. Now, of course, that is a name owned by WWE or TKO Group. They can't call him Bastion Booger. What do you think they called him? Uh, the, the Snot Man. Mike Booger Shaw. <laughs> Mike Booger Shaw. Mike Booger Shaw. Poor Mike. <laughs> and that, and by the way, that was another one that Vince took personal interest in and in glee because he loved the music of the belches and the fart noises and the sloppy eating that Bastion Booger would come to the ring accompanied by. And and how old was Vince 30 years ago? He was still a fucking almost a 50-year-old man, and that's yeah. he just loved that shit. He couldn't get enough of it. <laughs> Upcoming figures include Jack Tunney, Slick, the One Man Gang with Real Denim, Hercules Hernandez and Paul Roma, Power and Glory, as well as with, a with real cocaine. With <laughs> As well as they just put out a new Andre the Giant, and uh, they have another one about to come out. I have to say, these are incredibly impressive toys. Uh, or I don't know if you're not allowed to call them toys. Adult collectibles. Yeah. Jim, I want to play a little Brian. bit. Brian. I want to play a little bit of audio here. One of the listeners just sent to us, so I haven't even heard this yet. It's an interview with Jeremy Allen White, who plays, I believe, Kerry Von Eric in the upcoming film The Iron Claw about what surprised him about the sport of wrestling. This is from Deadline Hollywood. Let's go to this. I mean, I think for sure I, I have to echo the athleticism. I mean, the sport is like, it's like dance, gymnastics, combat sport. It's like so many things, the endurance that it takes. Um, but then I think what, what struck me in working with, with Chavo and, and preparing was like, I was thinking about it in like the sense of like a choreographed fight scene where I was like, okay, like, I'll hit the guy here and I'll drop kick here and I'll go off the rope here. But I wasn't thinking of it in the sense of like a full performance, a full narrative, full storytelling. The moments in between these moves are oftentimes even more important for the audience than the moves themselves. Like that's yeah. what gets people sucked in. That's what gets people excited. And so then like your, your energy, like I remember I'd have this routine, I'd be jumping up and down and off the ropes and all the stuff, I'd be exhausted. And then Chavo would say, and then you have to like charge up. And I was like, charge up? I'm like, I want to breathe. <laughs> and I'd, like, catch my breath. And he was like, no, you gotta be stomping. You gotta be, um... and I think that was like, um, that was fascinating understanding, I think the, the, the wrestling world and, and that, that broader aspect of like, 
of the storytelling and these guys as as real um, performers outside of the obvious like athleticism. Um, they're real um, real artists and, and real performers and real storytellers. Yeah, you know? and the and the. Well, there it is, the audio from uh, Jeremy Allen White from the Iron Claw film, the Kerry Von Erich in the film, and someone sent it to us, a listener, Kent S. It is possible for people to get it. It'd be nice if those people ran wrestling promotions, but still, it's good to see. Yes, this guy knows more about what he's talking about than 80% of the guys in any of the promotions in the business these days, because it's not just the athleticism where you're doing, as he said, or how did he put it, a choreographed fight scene. It's the, the things in the middle he's talking about, the reactions, the facial expressions, the, how, the pain, how did that move or slam or bump feel and impact you how did it change the the momentum of the match the emotions that the guys are having is one guy is sensing the victory and he's glorifying in it and the other guys oh my god i'm so fucked up and then when the momentum changes how do they react and what is their their attitude they're giving off do you like them virtue of their body language or dislike them because of their body language those are the things he's talking about as an actor he actually got an understanding that it's not just about whether you walk in and say the line it's how it's done and how you deliver it and with the timing and the positioning and the pacing sounds like someone gets it but a lot of people don't and there's a lot of wrestling fans wondering what happened They've been asking that for a long time. If only there was someone to sue. <laughs> You've just given up, haven't you? I don't know where to go. You've just rolled. You don't know where to go. You're making good time, but you're hopelessly lost. What about, you know, that's the thing, is that if you don't know where to go or what to do, chances are that somebody has hit you with a car. And that's why you're so confused. You're laying in the street and you can't get your wits about you, and you need somebody to fight for your rights and compensate you for the fact that your, your gonads have just been flattened into the pavement, and that's where you call this man. Call Stephen P. Of the rest. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. If you've been run over in the street, Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888. No, that's the old number, 877-50-STEVE. He, if you've been run over in the street, he will make the other driver pay you. If you've been wrongfully terminated, he'll make your ex-boss pay you. If you've been damaged or poisoned by an evil large corporation contaminating your environment, he'll make the evil large corporation pay you one way or another there's all kinds of things that are common about this that's you get paid courtesy of stephen p new at newlawoffice.com 87750 steve the consigliere of the cult of cornet the man who makes everything right when the judge hammers down that gavel and the case is closed you'll be smiling and happy and farting through silk because you were represented by a man, a myth, and a legend in those Beckley Mountains, Stephen P. New, the call of the wild West Virginian. When I'm calling New. Oh, Jesus Christ. The they, hell was they, that? They, what was that? They do that across the hollers from the mountaintops to the valleys below. When I'm calling New. And New answers Stephen P. New, and he'll fight for your right to party. He will fight for his clients uh, to win. Yes, and then they'll party. Partying is not guaranteed. Well, the winning is pretty much guaranteed. I mean, you'd have to have a pretty poor case to lose with Steve on your side. Well, there's no guarantees for the record, but he has a... Uh... No guarantees of a party after. You can just go quietly home and mind your own business. That's right. With Stephen Pinu. Well, yes. not with him, but... 
Well, you can... With him on your go, side. He'll go home with you if the judgment is big enough. <laughs> it just remains to be seen where his cash flow is at these days. Would you, but if it's a, would you like a, a night with Stephen P. New, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Do you have a big case and would you like a night with Stephen P. New? A night with New. Once again, 8-3... Uh, <laughs> what is it? 877-507-8383. Well, it's, it's 877-50-STEVE. For those of you not numerically inclined. All right. Well, before we leave, let's get a little guess the program here, Jim. It's been a oh, while. you teased me with that earlier before we went on the air. I've been waiting for that. All right. We got some programs Hold on, here. Let me... They're a brand new piece of paper here. These right here are programs from my personal collection. They have not yet been filed away, so they are here in the to-be-filed uh, pile. The to-be-filed pile. To-be-filed pile? <laughs> yes, right. God damn it. Let's start with this one, Jim. People listen to this on purpose, you know. The uh, Let's not start with this one. Let's... And I will have absolutely no pre-knowledge whatsoever what you're about to say and i will just to explain the the concept of this bit i will attempt to give the year and the location of the card in question that you are reading to me hence the guessing of the guess the program yes. yeah well yeah. i just want to make sure everybody was clear for the record i'm the great brian last and here with me mr jim cornett yes i think they know that part just want to make it clear uh jim our first program here I stopped myself. I was about to say where it was from. <laughs> Our first program here, <laughs> opening bout one fall, Tim Woods, 220 out of Ithaca, New York, versus Frank Valois, 245 out of Canada. Ooh. Very early in Mr. Woods' career. The second contest, one fall, special is what it says. Tito Carrion, 220 out of Puerto Rico, versus the great Malenko. 230 out of Russia. The next contest, one fall. Little Darling Dagmar. Oh. 41 inches tall. She was a little cutie. 86 pounds, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Versus... <laughs> what? What's the Ver matter with you? I never saw the inches tall listed before. Yes, that was the way they did it back then. See? Don't you see? Well, I see now. Versus Diamond Lil... 44 inches tall, 83 and one half pounds, Richmond, Virginia. You can catch her on Wednesdays mowing Moolah's lawn. <laughs> but the next, the next well, time that, that, and that was uh, Lil lived uh, Katie. Was her Katie Glass was her name. Diamond Lil was a famous Mae West character in, a, in one of the Mae West movies. And uh, she lived with Mae and, and Moolah for years after the, uh, they, they all retired. Jim, for the World Tag Team Championship, best two out of three falls, one hour time limit. The present world's champions, Don Curtis, 235 out of Buffalo, and Mark Lewin, 230 out of Buffalo, versus Skull Murphy and Brute Bernard. And finally, the world's heavyweight championship match, best two out of three falls, one hour time limit. The present world's heavyweight champion, Lou Thez, 235 St. Louis, versus Bob Orton, 261 Ooh. Kansas City, Missouri. Okay, and there were things that would send you in the other direction. Uh, Curtis and Lewin were a huge babyface tag team in the Northeast, and... Did Skull Murphy and Brute Bernard not have a brief flirtation in the Northeast, also as a tag team in the early 60s? But then with Thez being um, uh, billed as world champion and Orton being, and that's Bob Orton Sr., being his challenger, and also Tim Woods being on the card, Frank Valois would make you think it was in the Northeast or even the Montreal area when we were going there first, but Woods we were and Malenko were going back to Florida. Um, the year would be in question, and since Thez is the champion, 
That would be between 1963 and 1966 because it would not be 1958 or before when Thez had been champion previously. And would this be it? Would it be a Tampa card? Possibly, probably. It also could be Jacksonville. But with a world title match on top, maybe even Miami. But um, let's go with um, Malenko and Graham were not on the outs till the later in the 60s. So he was still worried. Let's go with uh, and Tim Woods in the opening match when he would become a legend. What year did he win the NCAA? Ooh. Or did he win the NCAA? Or did he just highly place? I only follow the professionals. Oh, come on. Um, 1965, Tampa, Florida. Ooh. The date, Wednesday, January 22nd, 1964. Ah! Jacksonville, Florida. Ja okay, well, I I botched that. I got within one year. I could have said Jacksonville, but what the fuck? Little darling Dagmar. A mere 86 pounds, only 41 inches in height, has pert a combination of midget muscle and beauty you ever will see in many a long day's journey. <laughs> <laughs> Little darling Dagmar was born and raised in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. In addition to wrestling, darling Dagmar has a wonderful voice and has made a few discs for her own use. Rock and roll, rhythm and blues, country and western numbers. After graduating from high school, Dagmar devoted all her time in training to becoming a professional wrestler. Dagmar's favorite holds are the airplane spin and the <laughs> giant swing, <laughs> which she finds most successful in attaining a triumph over her adversary. She can also turn on the heat when her opponent uses foul tactics. Darling Dagmar is rated very highly amongst the demi <laughs> amongst the demi <laughs> I can't even say it. Amongst the diminutive female wrestlers. Dagmar was the top baby face of all the girl midgets. And one time, I think it was 1975, we had a five-girl a five midget girl battle royal. And obviously the top rope rule was not in effect. It was a pinfall deal, but it was Diamond Lil, Darling Dagmar, Honey Girl Page. Oh gosh, what were the other two's name? Because Moodle only had five girl midgets, I think, at the time. So they brought the whole the whole stock in. And they would do that a lot, especially in the Southern territories. They'd mix up a grown man and a midget girl or whatever in mixed tag team matches. But go ahead, extol more virtues of Darling Dagmar. No, that was it. Those were all of her virtues. Uh, Jimmy Murdoch is the promoter here. And actually, that because later on in Jacksonville, by the 70s, Don Curtis would be the promoter. That's right. In Jacksonville. Technically, the promoter is Jimmy Murdoch Incorporated, actually, as listed here. <laughs> But Big Time Wrestling returns next week, Thursday, January 30th, 8.15. Coming up Friday, February 7th, Dave Brubeck. All right, there's a show to go to. All right. All right, Jim, our... Dun, 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 our next card here, let's go to this one. The card, the opening bout, Art Mahalik versus Woody Farmer. The second contest, the Mauler versus the Bavarian. <laughs> the next contest, a tag team match, tag team action, Kenji Shibuya and Pepe Lopez versus Tony Rocco and Pantera Negra. The next match, a Texas death bout, falls don't count, winner must walk out, Pedro Morales versus the great Kojika. 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 A special semi-main event. Best two out of three falls. Rocky Johnson 
versus Cyclone Negro. And the main event, best two out of three falls, title not at stake. It is the hate battle of the century. <laughs> Freddie Blassie versus Don Carson. Okay. In that case, we are in Los Angeles. And just going up and down the card, Art Mahalik, Art Boom Boom Mahalik, was a uh, NFL football player at one point, correct? Woody Farmer would go on to uh, have a few spots as a character actor in motion pictures, I believe. I have no idea who the Mauler or the Bavarian were. Kenji Shibuya was one of the great uh, Japanese heels of the 60s and was huge in Northern California for the Shire Territory. Pepe Lopez was a journeyman who spent a lot of time in the Tennessee Territories, and it was he and Frank Hester that were the mass dominoes that were killed in the car wreck with Sam Bass in 1976. Pedro Morales, this is long before the well, not I don't say long, uh, but this would have been before the, or would have been after the WWF run. There's Rocky. No, this is late 60s, isn't it? Or it's before his WWF title run. Maybe right before, as I'm looking at this. Blassie and Carson did their big business around about the time right before or right after as the Tolos Blassie Coliseum show, I believe. And Don Carson is one of those guys that, as a heel, to look at him, you would think, this fucking outlaw fuck, but he was such a promo. Even though he had no physique, he was such a promo, that's why later on he became a, a manager with quite a bit of heat. That And he was such a Southern, like a, a blonde Ron Wright. And he had all the gimmicks, the, the black glove that was loaded and all this stuff. He and Ron Wright actually sold out the Knoxville Civic, Civic Coliseum six weeks in a row in 1973. But he, um, he didn't, you know, he didn't make it on top in the major territories except for this run in Los Angeles because they did a deal where he and Blassie were partners and then he turned, correct? If I remember properly? I don't want to... You're not going to give me any help to I'm try to... I'm trying not to until you actually guess yes. something. So, so I've meandered around to say that this is the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles, California. And if I had to pick between 71 and 72, I'm going to say 19... Uh, well, because wait, Pedro won the title and said, Could this be 1970 in Los Angeles at the Olympic Auditorium? The date Friday, April 3rd, 1970. Ah, the Olympic Auditorium, Los Angeles, Boom. California. Boom goes the dynamite. You ought to give me a sound effect when I nail it. There you go. For or maybe not. Second World Battle Royal, 22 wrestlers, $11,000. Friday, January 15th, 1971. Advanced tickets on sale now, Olympic Auditorium. $5 and $3.50 reserved. Children under 12, half price. Sorry, discount cards will not be honored on this date only. Best seats are available now. So they sold tickets to the ba annual Battle Royal nine months in advance. That's amazing. Oh, wow. This is April 3rd. Yeah. I didn't even, you yeah. know, I didn't even put two and two together there as I saw this. Wow. Yeah, no, that's the thing. Because San Francisco and Los Angeles, the annual Battle Royal, that was the big show of the year. It was the only place really after the initial flurry of Battle Royals became a thing that it meant something somewhere. Extra, extra, extra. NWA gives Blassie the America's title. Just as we were about to print this program, word came in that the official meeting Monday, March 30th, the NWA announced, after viewing films and hearing testimony from wrestlers and lawyers, Freddie Blassie be given the America's Championship. 
As far the NWA could see, Blassie did lose the event to Johnson. However, the St. Louis Blonde was not pinned or did not submit, but was disqualified for outside interference, and the title cannot change hands on a disqualification. Official verdict! Monday, March 30th, 2 p.m., St. Louis. Freddie is on caps. <laughs> Freddie Blassie be given the America's Championship and will be recognized as the title holder by the National Wrestling Alliance. So there it is, an official edict from the NWA. Jim, you this, can tell it's official. This next program is, not that this would be anything to give away, but this is a bit of a big event for what this show is. The opening contest, Tiger Nelson versus Angelo Savaldi. The next bout, Wild Bud Cody versus CC Willie Nieves. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the next contest, Jim LaRock versus Billy Darnell. Okay. All right. Give me some frame of reference here. Next, we have a tag team match, two out of three falls. Sailor Thomas and Miguel Perez versus Brute Bernard and Skull Murphy. And finally, the main event, six-man tag team action. Pampero Furpo, Roy Heffernan, and Al Costello. It does not say it here, but of course, those are the fabulous kangaroos. Right. Versus... Cowboy Bob Ellis, Johnny Valentine, and Antonino Rocca. Good Lord. Boy, howdy. Um, Billy Darnell was one of the baby faces that uh, Buddy Rogers liked to take around as part of his crew. He had the Tarzan outfit and everything was very dashing jim larock was a big baby face in the evansville indiana area back in the late 50s early 60s obviously sailor r thomas and miguel perez teaming indicates against brute bernard and skull murphy indicates that it is the early 60s because art thomas was a big drawing card in the northeast uh, right, and and also Chicago and other places, but Perez was, if Perez and Rock are on the same card, and Billy Darnell's on the show, and I talked about Brute Bernard and Skull Murphy having a, a run in the Northeast, so did, the fabulous Kangaroos Heffernan and Costello, so did Valentine, so did Cowboy Bob Ellis. But this wouldn't. This has to be the early 60s because it looks odd for a lineup for late 50s. It were somewhere in the Northeast, but it's not the Garden. It may be an offshoot of the Northeast. It might be a Pittsburgh or it might be a, a, uh, a Baltimore or some town that was not completely under the McMahon control at that point. My phone is ringing, but I'm not going to use the lifeline. Um, I'm going to go 1962. And we're going to say it's in Washington, D.C. Well, you get a little bit of this. And then you also get some taken away. Uh. The date, Saturday, March 24th, 1962. The Newark Armory. Son of a bitch. And it has a picture here on the other side. I'll read uh, what it says. 30th anniversary program. Newark Armory. Saturday, March 24th, 1962. And in this photo, left to right, Willie Gilsenberg and Babe Coleman. Two of the nation's outstanding boxing and wrestling promoters. With a shake of the hand... They became partners on March 24th, 1932, and tonight, T-O-Night, tonight, are celebrating their 30th year together. So Willie Gilsenberg, oh. future WWWF president, 30th anniversary as a promoter in Newark. And 
That's why they had a six man on top then, because they wanted to give all those guys an easy night for a Newark Armory show. Ellis, Valentine, Rocca, the Kangaroos, and Furpo, six man. Nobody has to work excessively hard. And the undercard, the first three matches, is kind of bleh. So I was thinking Washington because of, uh, honestly, because of Valentine and Thomas. But nevertheless, I'm always blown away when these cards or these programs have schedules just so you can kind of see, you know, this is just New Jersey. So, the, you know, this program has nothing to do with anything else happening in any other Vince Senior town or Vince Senior state, I should say. Coming attractions. Monday, March 26th, Moose Hall, Trenton. Friday, March 30th, Temple Hall, Highland Park. Saturday, March 31st, the Jersey City Armory. Monday, April 2nd, visit the beautiful Gladiators Arena, <laughs> Route 46, Totowa, for the opening wrestling program. All the outstanding TV stars will be in action. Also, Saturday, April 14th, Patterson Armory. And then once again, they come back to Newark, Saturday, April 21st. So, regular small towns being run. Well, yeah, and, and that was one of two or three towns they were running in the territory that night, because when you think about it, this was the big, Willie Gilsenberg was figured in as obviously, as you mentioned, he'd go on to be WWF figurehead president. He worked with Vince senior for years and years. So he gets a big card, but there's only 10, 11 main event guys. And if you count Darnell, who was on the downhill slide at that point, and then the preliminaries. So they could have three or four of these shows with all the talent they would keep in the territory at one point running in various places and then have everybody or most everybody, all the big names at the garden or Boston or whatever. All right. And, uh, I don't think you'd ever get this one, but just because I don't, I don't think you would ever get this one. But all right. Here. Well, now we don't hold an idiot in suspense. Well, okay. Give it to me anyway, now real quick. Here's the, uh, trying to see if there's anything else in here. Here's the card. Uh, catch weights, one fall, 10 minute time limit. Jack Walters versus George. Strigler, 165 pounds, one fall, 20-minute time limit. Pat McGill versus George Poulos. Okay. Welterweight, one fall, 20-minute time limit. Billy Grubbs versus Leonard Jake Jacobson. And the main event, one fall, 20-minute time limit. Red Lions versus Dude Chick. Okay. Would that later on become Billy Red Lions? When did he debut? I don't know. Well, because this is going to be in the late 30s. This this may... Well, I don't want to say this possibly could be Billy Red Lions. Dude Chick was a journeyman pioneer name in... And the fact that they're also mentioning catch weight and welter weights, that goes back to the old days. Billy Red Lions was Canadian originally, so and this would have to be early in his career. And I'm trying to what he and um he and Red Bastine were on top as a tag team in the early seventies, right? Was it late sixties, early seventies? And yeah. he was he was still in good shape, but he was older at that point. God, well, it it couldn't be after mid nineteen forties, and I'm wondering if this is somewhere in the either in the Ontario area or in the upper United States. In that, you know, is it upper New York State or somewhere around Michigan, Ohio, and in, in between nineteen forty and nineteen forty five? That's as close as I can do. The show, the Hollywood American Legion Stadium. Oh, my God. Saturday, December 14th, 1935. Shit. This is absolutely not the same Billy Red Lions because Billy Red it Lions was born three years earlier. Yeah, okay. In that case, then Dude Chick. Has that the, makes has the greatest now. name ever. Well, yes, he does. But that makes sense because he was a pioneer guy, Hollywood Legion Stadium out in California. He did a lot of stuff in the West, and I at first thought it was the 30s, but I 
got sidetracked thinking that was Billy Red Lions, and it couldn't be. It's interesting. Everyone has a hometown listed except for one guy in the catchweight bout. Jack Walters, it just says, Employees Association. <laughs> and if you go earlier in here, it has a lowdown of all the matches. Jack Walters, an employee of our electric shop, has been following athletic activities for several years and has the belief in himself to tackle a veteran of the wrestling sport in a handicap match. He should be admired for his nerve and grit. George Strigler, alias The Eel, was holder of the lightweight belt for both the Army and Navy during wartime, and we failed to see any sign of his slowing down. All right. Red Lions from Texas here, by the way. Dude Chick from Wyoming. And finally, one last card here, Jim. Opening bout. Preliminary, one fall, 15-minute time limit. Leo Garibaldi versus Hans Schnabel. Schnabel to you. Second bout, semifinal, one fall, 20-minute time limit. Rita Romero versus Al Saz. S Z that is, that is pretty S Z A S Z is it not? That is correct. That is okay. correct. Main event: two out of three falls, sixty minute time limit. Danny Savage versus the Mighty Atlas, and it says once again: main event: two out of three falls, no time limit. Each man has agreed not to use his favorite hold: the twisting head scissors or the atomic drop. Miguel Guzman versus Sonny Myers. Okay. Leo Garibaldi uh, was a uh, one of a member of a wrestling family, and he later on became a promoter in various places uh, in Texas. And he had the, the program. You've got some of them probably. Garibaldi's Grappler. Those are the best programs. Like the yeah. paper they used. There's no other program used like that stock of paper. It's amazing. It was very nice. It was the uh, the the satin, not the satin, but the textured finish. Or yeah, whatever. yeah. Uh, Hans Schnabel, journeyman wrestling heel. Rito Romero was a huge name in West Texas and, and that area. Al Zaz was a journeyman. The Mighty Atlas was Morris Shapiro. And he was big, especially in Chicago in that area in the in the 50s, in the early rounds of TV. Miguel Blackie Guzman was one of the great lucha stars in Mexico of the, I guess, late 40s and early 50s. And for whatever reason, he ended up living in Indianapolis. And this guy who was a major attraction in lucha libre in, in the entire country in, in the 50s, as I said, was doing jobs for bruiser in 1975 miguel blackie guzman and he'd get heart punched box baker in fucking four minutes and sonny myers obviously a, a long time star in the central states area but he worked a lot of places and i've got to think that this is texas because of guzman sonny myers spent time there rito romero and the time frame, I got to think it's the mid-50s. Is this... Is it the Dallas or... Dallas or the San Antonio offices from 1954? The date, Wednesday. November 21st, 1951. Shit. San Antonio, Texas. The WrestleFon. Okay. Well, at least I got that much. The promoter, Dorothy Livingood. The matchmaker... And boy, Frank, was she. The matchmaker, Frank Brown. The secretary, Josephine Little. The athletic commissioner, Luis Quintanilla. And the commission doctor, David F. Davis, MD. And your announcer is Joe McHugh. On the front cover, we have a picture of the Mighty Atlas performing one of his many feats of strength. It appears he's trying to either rip a nail out of a board with his teeth or hammer it into a board with his teeth. It's not exactly clear what he's doing here. 
And also in here, it says that Danny Savage turned down prelims. Danny Savage, fraud voice grappler from Salt Lake City, has been off the last couple of WrestleThon Matt cards because he wouldn't take prelims offered him. Savage stated he wasn't a preliminary wrestler and had proved it by beating lots of men here and by drawing packed houses when he was in the main events. He also stated he had been willing in the past to show he was strictly a main eventer, but he wasn't wasting his time on further supporting bouts after having wrestled as hard as he did to prove himself. All right. Don't forget your peanuts. And then has a copy here of a letter allegedly sent by Fred Atkins to Mr. Alton Erickson, the commissioner of wrestling, Austin, Texas. Dear Mr. Erickson, as required by the Texas State Athletic Commission, I am presenting this written formal protest on my behalf concerning my match with National Wrestling Alliance World Heavyweight Champion Louis Fez in San Antonio the night of November 14th, last. This is dated the 15th. During the third fall of the above stated contest, Louis Fez, <laughs> using the name Louis instead of Lou just makes it sound like a teacher writing this. Louis Fez attempted to drop kick me, but I was able to avoid the movement, which unfortunately caught state licensed referee Leo Voss, partially stunning him when Louis Fez missed his drop kick and made it possible for me to body slam him and pin him for over the required three seconds needed to win a fall in this state. However, the referee, Leo Yas, temporarily... Voss. What's that? Voss. Oh, Voss, excuse me. It looks yes. like they used a Y here and a V up there. Leo Voss, temporarily put out of action, was not there for the count. Realizing this, I released my pinning hold on Fez and went to the assistance of Mr. Voss, thinking I could still pin Fez if I could get the referee back in action. While helping Voss to his feet, I was caught on the back of the head by another dropkick from Fez, this one connecting and sending both Leo and me to the mat. I am told Voss landed near where I landed on the mat and proceeded to count me down, which I admittedly was, but my protest is this action which followed my pinning of Fez earlier, which should have made me the NWA champion. Your local commissioner, Mr. Louis Quintanilla, I understand, could not make any other decision than that made by Leo Voss because he was unable to see everything that went on due to excited fans jumping up on the seats, <laughs> cutting off his view. Realizing Mr. Quintanilla's reluctance to pass on such an important matter, I request your getting further information from referee Voss, Mr. Frank Brown, and Mr. Quintanilla. I will present, under oath, any further questions concerning this protest. I agree to abide by the commission's decision on this matter. Signed, Fred Atkins. Do you know what the beautiful part of that is? No. Is that that was obviously a revolutionary finish that they had never seen before and required detailed explanation. And it sounds plausible. Because they, it wasn't just like, oh, we're going to do the deal where the referee gets bumped and he's knocked out for three minutes while we do all this other gaga. It's, oh, shit, I'm sidestepping the drop kick. Boom, he caught the referee. Oh, shit, got to help the referee up. Boom, get hit in the back of the head. And the world title hangs in the balance. And did the right guy win? Probably not. But, God damn it, the commissioner couldn't do anything because he couldn't see what happened. Because the fans were jumping up and down. So, I want a rematch. That was a hot angle because the people had not seen it. It wasn't prostituted and done to death and made to appear ridiculous and happening over and over and nobody thinking the little details. And that's how you built rematches and demand for rematches or, you know, kept programs moving where they were running the town every fucking week. So, you know, again, 
all of these things that we take for granted now are so corny and so overdone and so unbelievable have gr grown out of shit that was done that really worked, that was believable and plausible and drew money, but it was creative then. It wasn't something that everybody had seen 500 fucking times. And it wasn't extrapolated to be done so ridiculously because that's just wrestling and that's the way we do it. You had to make it look legitimate. All these things have basis in fact and originally could have the double referee finish, whatever, could actually happen the way that it was first done. But then as years go by and more and more people steal the ideas, they forget about closing up the little loopholes and making the logic make sense and just want to do a finish by the numbers rather than making it fit exactly that scenario that you're in the middle of, and that's why it worked to begin with. Well, that was this week's edition of Guess the Program, and as we begin to wrap things up, Jim, one thing happening right now, breaking news. Uh-oh. Brandon Thurston on Twitter from WrestleNomics. Vince McMahon is selling 8.4 million of his shares in TKO. Jesus. To the company itself. It's about 30% of his roughly 28 million company shares. I was going to ask how, uh, uh, how much he has to begin with. So we'll see where this goes, but Vince is selling shares. It appears they're buying it from him. Hmm. And we were speculating, uh, on a show a few weeks ago about his stock being unlike other people's and that he can sell it anytime he wants to. And we were asking ourselves, did he insist on that to be able to get out whenever he wants to, or did they insist on that to be able to get him out whenever they want to? Because the TKO group just released a statement that they're continuing to undergo, how did they term it? Significant expenses on the investigation of Vince and his improprieties, and it, it's possible that Vince McMahon being affiliated with their company could have a negative effect on the stock price or on business. That's, po that's a possibility. They've already put that out. Are they trying to slide him out slowly where nobody will notice? I don't think that's an option. Everyone will notice. He'll be kicking and screaming. <laughs> Well, we will stay up to date and on the story. And twisting his mustache. Do you know anything about the Ramones? Not a fucking lick. You no, didn't like he, the Ramones he's related all? to all of them. When was the first time you heard the Ramones? I don't fucking know. You never had a moment where you're like, oh my God, what is that sound? What is that? I need to find out more about this. No, not with them, no. <laughs> wow, well, me and Mr. White Bread Lamo here are going to wrap up another episode. <laughs> Thank you, Rocky. Do I have a... Uh... I had. Where the fuck? Where I'll take the big one. All right, that wraps up another episode. Someone took my pentatonic, uh, Kalimba. But we'll be back on the Jim Cornette experience before you know it. There's so much happening. There's pay per views, there's big events. You'll hear all about it on the experience. And of course, next week, right back here on the drive through, there's Dude Chick. Dude Chick. And of course, whether you're a dude or a chick, subscribe to the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette. It'll be the first thing that pops up. Full episodes, clips of episodes, omnibus collections, all with the very popular Travis Eckle artwork. The official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Of course, go through the archive, patreon.com slash Cornette. For only $5 a month, you get to go through the archive going back to 2013, the drive through and the experience patreon.com slash cornet you can follow jim on twitter at the jim cornet you can follow me on twitter at great brian last and of course the wrestling news wherever you find your favorite podcast or the wrestling news.com cornet's collectibles at jim what's going on jim make everybody happy for christmas get the midnight express figures get the t-shirts get the books get the dvds get the pictures get everything just get it just get it get it get it jim and of course, the drive through is brought to you by the Law Office of Stephen P. New, 888-692-8084. Get even with Stephen 
and newlawoffice.com. But for Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. We'll see you next week and on the experience. Tally ho! Woo!